Okay, this meeting is called to order. Good afternoon, I'm Rose Munoz at 435 on January 25th, calling this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara School Board. Uh, as it says in the agenda, due to the changes required in Assembly Bill 361, the public may now call in in the meeting in real time by raising their hand during each separate agenda item. Therefore, at this time, if there are members of the public who want to speak to an agenda item related only to closed session, please raise your hand on Zoom now. Uh, Ms. Trujillo, are there any members of the public who wish to comment? Good afternoon, President Munoz. We don't have any public comment on closed session items. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll adjourn to closed session and return to open session at 5.30 p.m. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Rose Munoz, and at 5.32 on January 25th, I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board. As it states on the agenda, uh, due to the changes required in Assembly Bill 361, the public may now call in to the meeting at real time. First, we're going to um, talk about the language access. Yep. Um, let's see. Thank you, Board President Munoz. Good evening. I will give this announcement regarding language interpretation in English and Spanish. Buenas tardes. Voy a dar este anuncio sobre la interpretación en inglés y en español. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bi-directional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are using a laptop or a desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are using an iPad or a phone, Locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. And remember when it's your turn to speak, please be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace. Thank you. And we are also offering American Sign Language ASL interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet or phone to join this meeting. If you joined this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior, inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y finalizar. O si está en inglés, dice done. Y recuerde, cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor, hable con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado. Gracias. Are there any questions with regards to interpretation? If there are no questions, then we may begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Dr. Maldonado, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Absolutely. Please rise and place, place the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, from closed session, the board did not, did not take any um, actions. Um, later in the meeting, we will be uh, going into the voting on that. And let's see here. Yes, Dr. Maldonado, will you continue with your report to the board, please? Thank you, Board President Munoz. Good evening, board members. 
For tonight's board uh, meeting, bo excuse me, let me start again. <laughs> For tonight's superintendent's board report, I only have two items. Um, I want to start off again in, in the tradition that we started a couple uh, meetings back with the principal spotlight. Tonight's principal is Brian Naughton from Monroe Elementary School, and he is ready to go. I'm turning this over to Principal Naughton. All right, good evening, buenas noches, Santa Barbara trustees and Santa Barbara community. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, as you know, my name is Brian Naughton and I'm currently in my 27th year as an educator and my seventh year as principal at Monroe School, home of the Mustangs. Uh, I started my teaching career back in 1994 at Holy Cross School in the Bronx in New York City. And I started my administration career in the Santa Barbara School District in 2004. I want to begin um, by thanking all of our Monroe parents and staff for continuing to use the Crisis Go app each morning. I also wanted to thank parents for giving their consent to test. As a parent of two children who both have had COVID, I want to acknowledge and express my understanding some folks may feel about testing, but I want to assure parents that the Monroe staff is committed to make students feel comfortable with the testing process and that we will continue to work with parents who have concerns. I'd also like to thank the entire Monroe staff and the district for their efforts during this unprecedented time in education. Thank you, Monroe staff, for giving us your best every day. And thank you to my district colleagues for supporting Monroe and all of our schools. Slide two, please. Thank you to the Santa Barbara community for passing Measure J back in 2016. As you may recall, Measure J was passed so that elementary schools could remove older, outdated portables and replace them with new permanent 21st century classrooms. I'm happy to report that progress on our site has been both safe and that the building project is going well. If you drive by Monroe School on Cliff Drive, you will notice that the framing of our five new classrooms is mostly completed at this time. I've been working with project manager Richard Werty, who's kept me informed on our Measure J progress. Right now, he and I are making sure we have the classroom furniture needed, such as desks and chairs. There are weekly construction meetings that I'm invited to and can attend. I've spoken to teachers and grade level teams that likely will be moving into the new facilities. It's up for some discussion, but depending on our enrollment and any other unforeseen factors, we will probably see both an upper grade team and a lower grade team move into four of the new classrooms and leaving one to be used as a multi-use classroom, such as a STEAM or a STEM room. We're hoping our Measure J facilities are ready for the start of the 2022-23 school year. Slide three, please. Before I highlight some of the priorities we have going on currently, I thought it would be appropriate to provide a brief historical context and understanding of our work that has helped transform our ability to evaluate and improve student outcomes. From 2015 up until the 2018-19 school year, the district and school sites partnered with Innovative Ed this important collaboration led all schools through a data-driven process to use lead and lag data to identify a specific academic focus and create a school improvement plan around that particular focus. Monroe's data showed that there was a strong need for improvement in higher order thinking skills and increasing structured collaborative conversations among students. To put it another way, the Monroe team created a plan to increase the level of rigor in our instruction in favor of more depth of knowledge level three and four questions and responses, and to increase structured student collaboration time versus teacher talk time. To do this work effectively and systematically, school leadership teams, SLTs, were developed to work interdependently with the district's leadership and site grade level teams. Subsequently, this process led to major improvements in our ability to access multiple measures of academic data, which directly led to, led to more targeted professional development for our staff. Kudos to our district colleagues who have helped improve our access to academic lead data and for re responding to site leaders' needs. With improved lead data systems, our MTSS team is better equipped to make informed decisions to support not just academics, but the social, emotional, and behavioral needs of our students. Another important outcome of our previous work was the importance of identifying and responding to the needs of our significant subgroups. Typically, our subgroups often score lower academically than their white students, miss more school, get suspended more, 
and get identified for special education and who often come to schools with other non-academic needs. As many of you know, Monroe is a Title I school. Many of our children are living in generational and or current poverty-like conditions. Many students are newcomers to the United States or are non-native English speakers or are students who have a learning disability, making school much more challenging. The Monroe staff recognize and are aware of our de demographics and the important role we have in creating strong relationships and trust with our students and families. If students and families feel connected to our school, we will be successful. We also understand that we need to use our financial, human and community resources effectively to provide support to those who need it when they need it. In a nutshell, we have to work effectively to accelerate learning and close the achievement gaps that have persisted, as well as be keenly aware of and provide social and emotional resources. Slide four, please. Another important outcome from our past seven years was our work identifying our institution unintended biases that are currently present or that are left over from tradi traditional teaching and learning settings and to integrate and cultivate the strengths of our diverse community. Working with our district and our community leaders in this field, such as Just Communities and UCSB, Monroe has developed an action plan that embraces the idea of mirrors and windows, meaning that our school must reflect the community that we serve and represent in all areas of the school, as well as recognize our own biases so that we can learn how to improve our practices. This work is ongoing and is essential to our success. Slide five, please. During my time in the mid 2000s, working as the Director of Professional Development at the Santa Barbara County Ed Office, I was very fortunate to have access to and visit successful school programs and see how they were able to improve student outcomes. When I was hired at Monroe in 2015, I brought teams of Monroe teachers to Santa Rosa Academy in Atascadero and Reagan Elementary School in Fresno to see successful response to intervention and positive behavioral interventions and supports programs. I'm proud of the work we did leading up to our current multi-tiered system of support system. MTSS has been one of the most important changes to come about in the past few years. Our MTSS team has helped develop a system to screen and progress monitor for academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs. In short, there are three tiers, with tier one being universal access to academics, meaning all students have the right to their grade level standards, curriculum, and instruction. Our classroom teachers using high quality instruction is essential. Teacher teams have built in PLC time to plan and monitor student progress. District, English language arts, math, ELD, and science coaches are often utilized to push into PLC times to support effective planning and teaching. Tier two is where strategic intervention or enrichment occurs for a smaller percentage of students. This tier is data-driven and meant to be used for short-term and fluid intervention of small groups of students. Tier three is also data-driven and a more intensive intervention designed to meet an even smaller percentage of students who are not responding to tier one or tier two. Monroe's intervention started with reading intervention only several years ago, but now we have the system in place to monitor academic, social, emotional, and behavior needs. We currently use student, a student risk survey scale developed by Dr. Shane Jimerson from UCSB, and we meet one-to-one -one with teachers three times a year to review student progress and determine needs. The MTSS team also meets regularly, weekly, to review data and discuss and make any adjustments. Recently, our lead data showed satisfactory growth and progress in our star reading benchmark percentages, but not the case for mathematics. And we determined that we needed to shift our focus and resources to math. As a result, one of our curriculum specialists and an instructional aide provide additional math support to several grade levels. We also created a four day per week after school math tutoring program that was based on academic need. Transportation and food are provided for students after school. Currently, we have three teachers and three classified staff tutors.
President Munoz, we have lost connection with Mr. Naughton. Apparently, we lost connection. Uh, um, are you, Mr. Naughton? Yes, I'm back. Okay, great. We'll go back up to your slide. Slide 68, these are images of our MTSS. If you come to Monroe, you will hear the slogan, Take Charge, in every classroom and around school. Take Charge is our PBIS statement or Monroe's core values that we developed several years ago after visiting Reagan Elementary School. CHARGE is an acronym that stands for students being compassionate, being healthy, being respectful, showing gratitude, and demonstrating effort. We go out of our way to recognize students for demonstrating CHARGE behaviors and academic achievement. You can see from the images, we currently have three plaques in our office and give students trophies when they reach one million to three million words read. Both our positive recognition and negative behavior systems are directly aligned to our CHARGE core values. When we see a student demonstrating a positive charge core value, any staff member can give a charge card to them. When a student demonstrates a negative behavior of a core value, staff discuss the incident with the student and are tasked with completing a recharge paper and discuss the staff, discuss with staff and students how to repair the relationship or core value that was affected. Slide nine, please. Like most schools, our parent stakeholder groups are key stakeholders. COVID protocols have impacted our parent groups from reaching their potential. For example, it took Monroe almost four months, but I'm happy to report that we now have a new PTA board up and running. We are very fortunate to work with our ELAC, school site council, special education parents, and student council groups to get good feedback on how to improve. We also have internal support from our district services, such as food services, the language access unit, and our family engagement unit that we can utilize to provide support to our families. Depending on our COVID situation and protocols, we will continue to nurture our partnerships with community and parent stakeholder groups to support our students. Slide 10. Moving forward, we are going to continue to keep the health and safety of our students at the forefront and align with health and safety protocols. We'll also continue to evaluate and improve our MTSS systems to provide the interventions and supports our students need. Uh, we ask parents to continue to work with us to find solutions on any issues. Thank you very much for this opportunity once again. Thank you very much, Principal Naughton, and congratulations to you and the Monroe community. And thank you for sharing all the work that you guys are doing and how it's connecting back to so many of our district goals. With that, uh, board members, I'd like to turn your attention to the bamboo uh, plants in front of you. January is board member recognition month. And it is a time for us to recognize the selfish, selfish, selfless. Ooh, that was a slip. The selfless work that you all engage in when you choose to run for office and become elected officials and serve your community. I wanted to use the bamboo because it was something that was taught to me as a leader many, many years ago. So just to familiarize ourselves, the bamboo is the largest member of the grass family, grows in warm or tropical regions where it often reaches 100 feet in height. Bamboo is native to the southern climates of North America and grows from 15 to 25 feet. Like all plants, the health and growth of bamboo is determined by its root system. But bamboo has a unique growth pattern. The root system grows as an underground colony. The plants do not grow alone. Strong vital nutrients that eventually produce above ground growth in the form of the familiar, familiar bamboo cane. To the untrained eye, recently planted bamboo appears to be doing nothing as there is no visible above ground growth after year one, year two, or year three. However, underground, the plant's maturing root system is busy developing, gathering nutrients, and preparing to explode with new growth at the designated time, typically the fourth spring. So in leadership, you can imagine that uh, sometimes we do things, we make decisions, and uh, we don't see immediate growth or an immediate offshoot. Um, and the lesson that you know, was drilled inside of me many years ago when I was a young leader is that it takes time. 
it, it takes time, it takes uh, persistence, and that uh, sometimes as elected officials or as superintendents or others, we may not see that growth and feel that we're not making forward uh, momentum or gains, but we really are laying the foundation with many of the decisions that we make for the future of the students of our community. So with that, I wanna recognize all of you uh, with, along with my cabinet and others who really wanna thank you for your public service and continue to let the public know how important it is for us to recognize what it is to be a board member during January, which is board member recognition uh, month. So take encouragement from the bamboo and know that good things take time. With that, that is the end of my superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Uh, I would like to recognize the retirees at this time. The teachers, um, Paul Foster, who is retiring after 27 years of service. Also, Karen McBride with 22 years of service. Clark Sayer with 25 years of service. Nancy Stevens with 16 years of service and Kirk Taylor with 27 years of service. Thank you so much for your work for our district. Um, the COVID report, it's like 552. Pardon? Okay, yes, okay, so we'll go ahead and, and go to board comments at this time. Um, Ms. Sims Moulton, would you like to go? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, have I said Happy New Year? But just in case I haven't seen you, Happy New Year. Uh, <laughs> so um, first of all, I just so appreciate the principal highlights. I know we've not been able to do that and have them in person. And so I really just appreciate the note to, to learn and see what's going on at our schools and to see that things are continuing to go on, you know, supporting our students throughout the year, even in the midst of these challenges and see how enthusiastic our students are and in the midst of the things and they're still learning. As the principal Martin said, take charge. I really like that at the Monroe Mustangs. Uh, I also want to thank you for this bamboo. So thank you for the appreciation <laughs> and the acknowledgement of, of the work, but also just also sharing the load with what you have to do as well. So I, I don't have a whole lot other than to say thank you and to appreciation to the work that you do. And I certainly appreciate the principal highlights that come up uh, every month. So thanks. Uh, Ms. Caps, would you like to make a comment? If you're driving down um, Garden Street, you might see these big solar uh, panels that are now, you know, getting ready to be transferred to our schools. And I'm just very excited. I see uh, Dave Hetyonk in the uh, boardroom back um, at a uh, temporary position to help us with facilities. And I'm just pleased uh, Mr. Naughton brought up the construction that's happening at Monroe. And there's such strong efforts to move us towards sustainability and uh, the future and renewables. And I just uh, had to point out uh, all of the work that continues to happen despite all of the many challenges. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, uh, thank you. And before I go to that, I would also like to recognize the classified retirement of John Whelan. Uh, thank you so much. And Ms. Alvarez. Thank you. I was looking at the personnel action items and I have to admit I had a very difficult time reading uh, Dr. Wagonet <laughs> retirement. I worked in education for many, many years and I have to say I, it's, Dr. Wagonet is one of the hardest working people that I have ever met. Uh, last year when I took office, I the, the first thing that I noticed was so many things that Dr. Wagonick was doing. So thank you for all your work. I know you have a lot of plans for your retirement. I have no doubt that you're going to be very busy <laughs> and very successful. And on behalf of the many, many, many students who you have served, thank you. Thank you for your service. And I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to recognize you from up here. So thank you. And also, thank you to uh, Principal Naughton. I actually run by Monroe, and I really enjoy seeing the progress. And seeing Dave Het Young here, it, it kind of brings it all together because it started many years ago, and seeing that progress, the framing going up, the classes taking, 
uh, taking shape and I, I was actually there this weekend and it's great. It's thank you to the voters for approving Measure J. The, there's your tax man money at work, and it's for the benefit of students. So thank you, uh, Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, also, congratulations to Monroe and Mr. Naughton for their focus and emphasis on higher order thinking and depth of knowledge, and really continuing a long tradition of excellence at Monroe, where. I'm very uh, sentimental about because my dad was a sixth grade teacher there in the 70s. Um, I also just want to mention that in the time since we met, I had the honor of working on the Black History Month resolution with Ms. Sims Moten, always um, quite an honor. And I want to also mention my appreciation to members of the public who have attended the hearing, um, the hearings on redistricting and written emails to express their perspectives to each of us and their ideas about redistricting maps. And just to reiterate that I learn something every time I read and consider what other people are thinking. There are a couple days uh, coming up that I wanted to highlight. January 27th is National Holocaust Remembrance Day, and on this day, the United Nation urges all of us to honor the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and the millions of victims of Nazism and to develop educational programs to help prevent future genocides. And also, February 1st is Chinese New Year, and it is the Year of the Tiger. Um, finally, welcome to our district, Mr. Masuda and Mr. Hetyank. I know you will both make us better, so thank you. Those are my comments. Yes, I just um, have a, a comment. Um, first of all, Dr. Wagenek, thank you so much for your service to our district. Um, I had been familiar with you when, since first attending board meetings um, before becoming being on the board and I'm indebted to so many reports about and all the progress that the district has made with the counseling and the support that's available to our students. It has really made a huge difference in the impact um, that it has on our students' lives and the families. Thank you so much. Um, and I will go now to Mr. Kelly for the student board report. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to, sorry. First, I want to express my gratitude to everyone um, in the building today, the cabinet, um, fellow board members. Thank you so much for uh, just accepting me as a part of this group and this system. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here every time we have a board meeting and working on everything within the district. Um, I would say to the students um, and staff and parents listening, I got tested at school today for COVID. Um, it was negative, it was a seamless process, uh, nothing to be afraid of for all of the students and parents that are concerned. Um, yeah, it was, su it was super easy, super efficient. Um, yeah, I I, there's nothing to be afraid of. And then, um, yeah, a lot of what I have to report is later on in the meeting during the uh, school mental health services update, so I'll update you more then. Uh, thank you. Okay, at this time we'll go to public comments on non-agenda items within jurisdiction of the Board of Education. Um, we have opportunity for comments on these items. Each speaker is allotted 90 seconds each. Please remember the new protocol and raise your hand on Zoom to be recognized. Uh, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comments on items that are not on the agenda? Thank you, President Munoz. We do have public comment on this item, and I will start with uh, Briggs. If you can uh, please state your full name. And if you can unmute yourself, please. I'm going to go to the next speaker and give and circle back to Briggs. Sander Kushin. All right. Hello, everyone. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Maldonado, board members, and Santa Barbara community members. I hope you all are well. Um, my name is Sandra Cushion. I'm here representing CalPERG. We're a member-based advocacy organization that works to protect public health, consumer rights, and our environment. Um, I've reached out to some of you via email, and I wanted to formally introduce myself in this setting as well. And I'm here today to just comment on one of our priority campaigns, which is a statewide effort to expedite the transition to all electric school buses. And why electric school buses? Well, because students deserve a safe ride to school, yet diesel exhaust is a known carcinogen that causes numerous health problems. And it's especially harmful to kids who have developing lungs. And the transportation sector is not only the largest contributor to air pollution, but also greenhouse gases in California. So on top of the air quality issues, electric buses also help with the climate crisis. Um, and not only do school electric school buses result in better air quality and fewer greenhouse gases, they have also been shown to be cheaper in the long run. Um, when you look at the maintenance and maintenance costs. Um, it's a great time to be investing in electric buses. Um, most recently, the governor offered 1.5 billion to support school transportation systems in his proposed budget. And school boards and districts across the state are already taking advantage of this moment. Right. So, thank you. Next speaker is Alyssa. If you can please state your full name. Alyssa, if you can unmute yourself. Um, I will return to Alyssa. And our next speaker is Michelle WQ. Hello, I was, uh, are you taking inputs now about the maps or is that later? That is later. This is non-agenda items. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, next speaker is Michael English. Oh. Mm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Michael English. I live in Santa Barbara. And uh, Santa Barbara Unified School District is a complex district containing uh, elementary and secondary uh, education. Adding two more trustees would promote more inclusiveness with the parents and teachers to better serve students. Teachers clearly want to be more involved and are tired of being scapegoats for uh, lack yes, of learning. Um, excuse me? Yes. Uh, right. That, that item go comes later in the agenda in order oh. to give a comment okay. on it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, President Munoz. Our next speaker is Roseanne Crawford. Ms. Crawford, if you can unmute yourself. Sorry, here we go. Good evening. While electric buses have a great ring to it, why are we going down that path? We could save so much more money by not having busing at all. With the Latinos, with the percentages all over, with the percentage of population that's growing. Hello, um, all, excuse all me. Schools should be Ms. Crawford. Um, uh -huh. Yes, the guideline is that you're not able to comment on another speaker's um, comment. Oh, but I'm making a general comment. Thanks. I, for a long time, have wanted to make a comment about why should not we have neighborhood schools. So I'm not attacking her in any way. I'm just saying, why are we still doing busing when we should have neighborhood schools right. everywhere? No, th that uh, would not be appropriate, um, but thank you very much. I don't understand what's not appropriate, but thank you. The next speaker is Briggs. You can please state your full name.
So we're not able to connect. Uh, I'm going to go to the next speaker, Alyssa. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. I apologize. Um, my name is Alyssa Jessley. I live in Santa Barbara. And thank you for the opportunity to comment. I am challenging the Santa Barbara Unified School District to acknowledge the following that they ignored the data and science when it came to masks and children and still mandated masks and stood for lockdowns and did more harm than good. That you acknowledge that you ignored parents and constituents who were concerned about the anxiety, depression, and developmental damages that masking children in lockdowns would do to kids and stared aired on the side of tyranny and irrationality. Acknowledge that true COVID-19 hospitalizations remain low in the state and particularly in Santa Barbara County and that we need to refrain from panic-driven restrictions that inflict additional collateral damage to our children. You acknowledge that the present Omicron variant is less deadly than prior variants, and acknowledge that those on the board who pushed for mass and lockdowns were wrong, must publicly apologize to parents and children for the damage and fear they've caused, and should resign or face a recall. All mandates must immediately end based on the data and science that's available right now for the County of Santa Barbara, the state of California, and the CDC. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Christy Sharp. Yes, my name is Christy Sharp. I'm a parent in Santa Barbara of two kids in school. Schools should not mandate the most dangerous vaccine in human history. This needs to stop. How many children are y'all gonna resuscitate on school grounds the day they get their shots and boosters? This clot shot has been ratified in the Hall of Records as a biohazard weapon. The CDC director admits COVID policies have failed and must be abandoned. The WHO says masks on children increase COVID risk. How many children are gonna be harmed before you guys will stop? As Dr. Robert Malone, founder of our mRNA, RNA, and DNA technology said, this is a psyops that is keeping you hypnotized in a state of fear so you will comply. It is time to stop the fear and get your power back. Take it back for our children, please. Thank you. Thank you. And just a reminder to the public that this is public comment on non-agenda items. The COVID report will come later in the in the meeting. Thank you. The next speaker is okay, and that concludes public comment on this item. Uh, thank you, Ms. Trujillo. At this time, we will go to the COVID nineteen board report number thirty four. Thank you, Mr. Vince. Will come up. Um, I also want to just before as he comes up to the podium, board members, I I want to acknowledge publicly and. Uh, my gratitude toward Dr. Ansorg and Dr. Dorinoso, who have been consulting with our team this week, two weeks ago, as well as we looked at, you know, all the different things that are happening with the virus, with Omicron, and I just want you to know how um, much I appreciate their time, their attention, and their guidance uh, in this time, and also our continued su the continued support of Susan Klein Rothschild, who's with us tonight, along with Mr. Matt Hicks. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Vence. Good evening, President Munoz, board members, and Dr. Maldonado. Uh, yes, it's report number 34. And uh, I would like to, to just um, uh, ask uh, Susan Klein Rothschild to join us and to, to give us an update regarding what's happening in the county. Susan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. January has been a difficult month uh, in Santa Barbara County, in the state and in the country uh, for COVID. As we all know, Omicron, the variant, took a very strong presence. Right now, the most recent data we have from Santa Barbara County, and this is as of January 20th, we had a case rate of about 181 cases per 100,000 in the population. That's really high. It's also helpful to know that earlier in the month, about January 11th or 12th, our case rate was about 250 per 100,000 population. So it is less than it was. We are not sure if it's plateauing or if it's really starting to decrease. Hopefully it's starting to decrease. Our test positivity has been 23.4% out of all those people who take the test, 
That's the number that tests positive. We know that based on the genotypes of the cases that have been looked at, all of them that we've looked at so far in Santa Barbara County in the most recent time period are Omicron. And that is true throughout the state of California. Omicron is dominant as a variation. Um, and we know that Omicron is more transmissible. So it's spreading quickly amongst many people. We are happy that the number of new cases is down from two weeks ago, and we're hopeful that the cases will continue to decrease. In terms of hospitalizations, those are up from two weeks ago. And we know there's a lag time between when someone becomes infected with COVID, they get sick, and then they get more severely ill. So we expect there to be a lag time between infection and hospitalization. Right now, hospital beds and staffed ICU beds, we're in the danger zone, very high usage right now across our county. The number of ventilators in use is very low. We don't see ventilators as needed as much with Omicron as it was in previous variants. With high case rates across the entire county, it adds stress to everyone because it's in the community broadly. So people who work in all levels of schools, students, teachers, administrators, bus drivers, we all are impacted, even though we are finding less transmission at school. School continues to be a very safe place. Schools follow the guidelines, students wear masks, they maintain healthy practices. So even though COVID is not transmitting at school, it is being impacted because people who have COVID come to school. It takes time to do testing. It takes time to make sure students don't have symptoms. And these have real impacts. There's also the impact of absences, student absences and staff absences, either because they have COVID themselves or because they're close contacts with someone who have COVID. The Public Health Department will continue here in Santa Barbara County to follow the California Department of Public Health guidance and recommendations. Um, and the school board continues to have, as they always have, the authority to make decisions for their districts in concert with the California Department of Education and Regulations. And Santa Barbara County Education Office will continue to provide consultation for school districts as they have, in addition to Santa Barbara County Public Health consultation for school districts. Just in terms of looking forward, we know we continue to learn as we get more data, as we see more of what happens, that in-person learning is best for students. It's best for them academically, socially, emotionally, and we want to do everything to protect them so they can continue to be in school where it's also best for their health. Schools are healthy places. We will do our best to monitor what's happening and hopefully Santa Barbara County in California will reflect some of the changes that we've seen in other places that have had Omicron earlier, just as it has opened quickly risen, we hope it quickly decreases and we have less COVID in our community and it's safer for everyone. I think that's my high level report. Matt Higgs, would you like to add anything? I don't believe he's on tonight, Susan, just you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Klein Rothschild. Uh, so please go back to slide two, please. All right. Uh, so as you noticed, the last time we had our board meeting, we were at 187.8 in terms of cases. And then as you could see, within two weeks, it went all the way, it peaked, and then it reporting from the last date, which was actually the 16th last Thursday, we got the data, it was 212. But as you heard from Ms. Klein Rothschild's uh, report, as of January 20th, so in the matter of really um, four days, it dropped to 181 cases. Next slide, please. So 
again, just taking a look, just reminding of us, reminding us, comparing what the previous variants, the, the previous uh, two COVID viruses compared to Omicron. And just showing you that, again, um, you know, January of last year was really the peak of, of the original uh, virus. And now looking at Omicron and how it actually spread. So it's very important to keep this into context because we want to remember not to continue to do the same practices, but really do practices that help us as we address Omicron, so which is different. So we need to pivot in a way that helps us to best support the students, the families, and the staff. So uh, next slide, please. So just a little news on the vaccinations. So with ages five through eight, there was an increase, but it's not as much as we expected. So it's at 28% um, and it did increase by a few percentages, percentage points, excuse me. And then 12 through 15, that, that age level that did increase by 70%, which is great to see. Uh, the 16 through 29 age group, it pretty much leveled out and we're at 71%. So that's what's happening in the county with our vaccination rates. Next slide. Okay, if you remember two weeks ago, we did screening of all the students and the staff in our schools. And it was quite a incredible task to take on. And, you know, it was tremendous uh, kudos to our staff who were able to implement this and get it done. So then the next question is, what do we do once we left screening everyone? And so what we actually did was we focused on and with the guidance with public that we received from public health, we focused specifically actually on four areas. So we, we did a re-entry testing because remember we had kids who did not show up on January 3rd because they were COVID positive. In order to return, we tested the students and staff as well. Uh, we also did um, group close contact testing and tracing. So at elementary schools, we were testing, we were testing the same class. If we saw like two or three or four cases, we went back and tested them uh, every other day just to keep track of that. So that's what we were doing in the elementary schools. In, in secondary schools, we realized that was, that was a heavy lift and we needed to start at, at some point. So we started with randomized testing at 20%, which is substantially higher than what we were doing before, um, before the winter break. So, uh, so we were doing that in secondary schools. Two other types of testing would be if you're symptoms, symptomatic testing, so students, staff having symptoms being tested, as well as uh, athletics. So we're con we continue to test with, with, um, with that as well, with the athletic directors. Next slide. So here's some of the data that'll just give you an idea of the various numbers that we've seen. So as of, um, Friday the 7th to Thursday the 13th, as uh, we saw specifically, oh, sorry, <laughs> the 14th, my, my apologies, Friday the 14th through the 20th, we had 490 positive student cases and 64 positive staff cases. What I was referring to was the previous week when we were doing screening, that, that Friday of the 7th through Thursday of the 13th, we, we actually had 681 student positive cases and 60 staff cases. So that means totaling as of January 7th, both numbers, we've, we've tested 1,171 students positive with COVID. So that's, a, that's the two weeks and 124 staff. The other thing I want to continue to reiterate as we have conversations with other school districts in particular is that we do have 96% staff vaccinated. And to actually give it a concrete number, that's out of almost 1,700 staff members, we have 68 unvaccinated 
staff members due to exemptions. So just to be clear about that. Next slide, please. One of the things that we started up after reviewing the, the data is, again, we, we implemented sports, athletics, and extracurricular activities. So that has been resumed along with testing of those. Uh, and as well as we had a vaccination clinic last week at Goleta Valley Junior High School. So specifically, we had that, that clinic was from 4 o'clock to 7 p.m. We had 273 vaccinations provided at the clinic within that time period, 224 adults and 49 children. This evening, we have a clinic at Harding. So, and that's obviously happening right now, and that's from four to seven. Uh, one of the things that I thought would catch your attention would be that uh, within one hour, we were texted, uh, Dr. Maldonado and I were texted, and they said they had, at five o'clock, within one hour, they had given 180 vaccinations. And then we were texted again 50 minutes later, and they were up to 240. So uh, just to let you know, we're seeing that there is really um, high desire and need for vaccinations. And it's, we have four clinics that will be scheduled for um, February. All right. Uh, so one of the other things that um, I wanted to bring up to you was where are we going for, for next week? Uh, so yesterday afternoon, uh, Dr. Maldonado, uh, uh, Nick, and myself, we met with Dr. Ansorg, uh, Dr. Dovernoso, uh, Matt Higgs, as well as Paige Batson to discuss um, what, what do we do in terms of group contact tracing and contact tracing? Because if you, if you do the numbers and do the math, it's an extremely heavy lift. And the principals have been informing us as we go, as well as you cannot be testing. Uh, we were asking, do we test an entire school district again? Is that another thing that we do? Or how do we approach this? One of the things that they mentioned um, that you might have read from Dr. Maldonado's uh, message that she sent to the public was one is that, you know, Everything is different with Omicron. So we have to, again, think differently. Uh, students are actually safer at school than they are in, in the community and at home. And the data is demonstrating this as they are looking at this. So one of the things that they keep saying, and they're reiterating, keep schools open. Keep classes open. That means that an outbreak, the term outbreak, it meant one thing when we, you know, last, what we called the good old days, which was just a couple of months ago, to now. An outbreak, you have three or more cases. That doesn't mean that you close that classroom down. You're just following it. The outbreak term is, a, is really supporting the data that, that the county needs in public health. Another thing is if you close classrooms down seven days, perhaps, if that's what you were doing, what you'll notice is that the class, that they, when they come in or come back, you might not gain the results that you want. That, so you might not reduce it just because of the way it, the, the virus is um, behaving in the community. And of course, the rates are lower in schools. That's one cl clear thing. So best to keep schools open. So with that being said, one of the things that we're going to continue to do, um, instead of doing group contact tracing and close contact tracing, we will continue to do reentry testing. We'll do, of course, athletics and extracurricular testing, symptomatic. We will do random testing as well as student and staff uh, self-selected testing. So to make sure that we are providing the testing resources that they need, as well as what we are aiming for specifically is continuing with the 20% mark. So making sure that we test students, 20% of the students, to make sure that we're keeping track 
and seeing what's happening in the schools and who's who um, needs to go home because of the positive cases. Another thing that they asked us to do is reinforce the ef the effects of you know of reinforce mitigating the effects of Omicron. So again, self monitoring for symptoms, no matter how minor the symptom is. They said in particular, it's not like um, when students were having a losing the sense of smell or taste. The symptoms now are, are, must, are much minor. So we need to make sure that we as students, staff, and ourselves monitor how we feel. And so that way we stay home, we get tested, and we make sure that everyone's safe. Continue to wear masks, N95, preferably high quality masks. As well as the last thing I would say is self-reporting with our uh, Crisis Go app, the iPass app. So that way everyone can keep track of it. So, and that's my report. Thank you. I do want to add the, the slide with the student in the alligator <laughs> suit. He is wearing an N95 mask. I don't know if it was that clear in the picture. Okay, um, thank you. Yes, uh, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comment on this item? Thank you, President Munoz. We do have public comment on this item. I will start with Maria Kastner. Hello, can you hear me? You can speak a little louder, please. Okay, um, well, first of all, Science 101. You have vaccinations that have zero long-term studies. You must have a control group, meaning you must have a group that's not vaccinated in order to know if vaccinations work, number one, okay? Omicron, I had the Omicron, our whole family had the Omicron, took a week and uh, none of us had any complications. And, but we know people, people both vaccinated and unvaccinated that had the Omicron, okay? That's number two. Number three, the county has refused any and all public records requests for data. Every time the county comes out with statistics, they will not provide us any data. We want to see the sources. We want to see the messy data, as Reynoso calls it. Stop this nonsense. Test for immunity. Number one, check for symptoms. Symptoms is where there is transfer. Also, right now, I can test positive on a PCR test, but negative on a rapid test. So this is so much confusion here. You know, I have the Omicron, I will test positive on a PCR test. I will test negative on a rapid test. And so show us your data. This has to stop. This, this insanity and pseudoscience has to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Justin Shores. Thank you very much. Um, the comment from public health about now they're finding out that children are, are safer in schools, that's really dishonest. That report has been out for almost a year now, and we've been saying it in public comment for a long time. So it's, it's insane <laughs> that, there's, they, that you, we're giving them so much credibility when this is all stuff that parents and you know, people have been saying in public comment for a year and you guys are just saying, oh, this is new information. That's bullshit. I'm sorry. Excuse my language. You, you need to realize that that's that it, you, you don't have any credibility if you're listening to people like that that are and are, that are not giving you consistent information. Children have, have always been healthier in class. That was a study done in Florida uh, a year ago by Mark Zuckerberg. So that's really dishonest for you guys to, to use that. Um, there's a study that, in fact, the study says this, I'm going to read it. Moreover, we find that children in lower social economic, socioeconomic economic families are the most affected. Results highlight that even in the absence of COVID, the illness, the environmental changes associated with COVID-19 pandemic is significantly and negatively affecting infant and children development. So you guys are, are making policy that's affecting our children. Your decisions are harming children. 
And they still are. You still are, are making them mentally. Um, they're they're going to be mentally hurt forever because. Of- Thank you. Next speaker is Christy Lozano. Hi, board. Mr. Vince's uh, report sounded really great. It was very nice, neat, and tidy. And you know, if he actually cared for kids, or you guys actually cared for kids. You wouldn't be following protocols given to you by whoever the big guys are paying you the big bucks to do what you're doing. They tell you to keep kids home. You keep them home. They tell you to send them to school and keep them there. You send them to school. They tell you to promote vaccines. You promote vaccines. They tell you to promote N95 masks. You promote N95 masks because you're getting paid to do it, not because you care. None of this is because you care for kids. So let's stop fooling ourselves into thinking that that's the reason. And it's really sad that 280 people went down tonight to get a vaccine because they're scared. They're doing it because they're scared, not because they think that you're actually caring for them because I don't believe you're caring for them and neither do a lot of people that call in and talk to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Pedro Hernandez. Good evening, and I'm, I'm with you all, and I'm not speaking to you, the board. I'm speaking to the people that are talking to you. I hope you finally listen to us and stop this mandate, okay? Leave our kids alone. You have your vaccines. You're protected, no? So leave our kids alone. Well, you said that the new variant is infectious. You said the new variant is infectious. However, you failed to mention that is not as pathogenic, which means it doesn't give you disease as, it, as Delta did. It attacks the upper airways, but not the deep lung. And that's something that you're failing to mention. I don't know why you're not telling the people that. <clears throat> also, you haven't, you haven't given us any peer review, reviewed data to support your mass mandates. You say, you, you, you're telling us, you're telling people to wear an N95 mask and you don't even provide any data on the adverse effects of wearing a, a mask. And how convenient, by the way, that you cancel the chat so that people cannot communicate with each other. Now we know natural immunity is very strong. The CDC finally admitted that. Listen to the people or get out. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Finnegan Wright. Uh, Hello, yes. Uh, I'd actually, wait, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd actually, I I want to thank the district for a lot of the actions they've been taking. Um, A lot of their actions have been uh, like staying in line with um, a lot of the important data we've learned from the WHO and the CDC and public health. Um, I really appreciate the the vaccine um, clinics that have been open to help students uh, be protected from the, uh, from COVID-19. I also appreciate the uh, the wide use of masks and the availability of N95 masks because it's very important that um, us students are protected. Um, oh, to reiterate, I'm a sophomore at Dos Pueblos High School. Um, no one I know has been bothered by wearing a mask, really. Um, we're all really happy with, um, well, not, uh, no one's happy with the COVID-19 pandemic, but we're all um, content wearing masks. We know this is very important for us to maintain uh, public health. And um, we really appreciate so uh, all the action that's been being taken by the district, um, the testing that was done at, after the break was um, and at the start of the Omicron surge was very good to help us know how we're doing as a district. And um, just overall, uh, I really appreciate the district sticking to um, public science and uh, protecting the health and safety of the student body. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Chelsea Lancaster. Uh, hello. I actually just want to amplify what uh, the the student who was before me said. Um, I want to uh, applaud you all following the science and protecting uh, not just our youth, but our entire community. 
Um, all of the comments that have been made by far right activists uh, like Justin Shores, A, you don't get to use marginalized people for your politic. Um, we know your intentions and they're not pure. And I also want to name. Excuse me. Um, excuse me, um, Chelsea, we're not able to, you're not able to address other speakers. Okay. During public comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, but keep following the science. Um, keep, uh, I'm sorry, you know, moving in ways that honor our elders, our immunocompromised folks, and our children who don't have agency in the decisions that adults are making about their future. I have a lot of people in my life that have long COVID. They're sick. They can't function the same way they used to. We don't know enough about the long-term impacts for young people. So we really need to move in a way that honors their future. Um, and again, that honors the people in our community that are most at risk. And I also want to applaud the teachers and the staff who are on the front lines, who are really struggling right now, frankly. Our system, I work at Santa Barbara City College, many of you know that, our entire system is in crisis. So we really need to support the people that are on the front lines that have actual equity perspectives and anti-oppressive perspectives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker is Peggy Wilson. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, the CDC came out today and said natural immunity is six times higher than being vaccinated. So I would like to see the school looking at kids that have natural immunity and not um, coercing them as another speaker said, and I agree with, um, kids just wanna fit in. So they're being coerced to take this. It is not a vaccine. Let's get to the facts. It is still an experimental use drug. It is mRNA uh, gene uh, therapy. So it is still experimental. And the test group is the kids. And it's unconscionable, as the person said before, let's follow the science. If you're following the science, as you realize, most, um, the, all the 15,000, 20,000 doctors with the Barrington Declaration have had their voices, MIT, uh, all kinds of very high educated virologists, their voices, because it does not go along, squashed. So you cannot say you're hearing all the information. So once again, this is an experimental drug being used on kids and it's unconscionable that you are still mandating it and supporting it. Next speaker is Judah Neeson. Uh, hi. I'm Judah Neeson. I'm a sophomore at Dos Pueblos High School, and I want to say that I agree with all the mask and vaccination mandates done by the school and all precautions uh, and measures that have been taken so far. All credible scientific sources show that both are infinitesimally less harmful than any case of COVID can be, and I have yet to meet a student who has been harmed by wearing a mask or by being vaccinated. Although it may be a mild inconvenience to go out of my way and get one vaccine every six months or so, it is more than worth it to protect us as a community. I personally am living with my grandparents, one of whom has recently gone through multiple surgeries, which left her even more vulnerable to the negative effects of COVID than an elderly person usually would be, which makes this very important to me uh, that we all stay safe. Lastly, I'm extremely thankful for the district's continued effort to protect your staff and students, as well as all of their families and our community as a whole. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Aries. Ivanova. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. My name is Eris Ivanova and I'm a senior at Dos Pueblos High School. I want to stress that the science is clear. The jury is not at all out here, despite the very vocal minority. We know both masking and vaccines are safe and effective at reducing incidence of COVID. I'm fully in support of mask mandates, as is the majority of the student body, and I applaud my school's effort to test and provide vaccines to students. Being, being immunocompromised myself, 
These measures allow me to reap the benefits of in-person schooling while minimizing the risk that my loved ones or I will contract COVID and risk serious and long-lasting complications. However, a problem with my school's response to the latest wave of COVID has been insufficient access to viable at-home schooling for students who are in isolation. If staying at home invariably means students will be unable to keep up with work and their grades will drop, it's inevitable that some students will come to school knowing they're sick which puts others at risk and constitutes a hole in our COVID response. I believe the district must take action to ensure that students have sufficient resources to temporarily access schooling from home. Again, I highly appreciate all the hard work the district has put in so far to keep us safe from COVID. Thank you. The next speaker is Michelle WQ. If you can please state your full name. Hello, my name is Michelle Westlander Quaid and um, commenting on the mandate. Per the news today, OSHA is withdrawing the COVID-19 shot mandate. And this is good because these shots are not vaccines, they're experimental gene therapies, and they're in phase three clinical trials, so they cannot be mandated. Furthermore, the CDC has admitted that these shots do not prevent infection or transmission. And we have no idea what the long-term effects of these vaccines will be, but we do know that there have been life-altering events. If you're familiar with the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, VAERS, it's a national early warning system to detect possible safety problems in US licensed vaccines. And it's co-managed by the CDC and the FDA. And data input is voluntary and time consuming, so the system does not capture all the cases. But per the 14 January, 2022 release of VAERS data, the COVID-19 vaccines have caused 1,053,830 adverse events including 174,864 serious injuries and 22,193 deaths. In the past, this data would have caused the vaccines to be pulled from the market, yet the CDC and FDA are still pushing these vaccines and have mandated certain healthcare protocols while restricting access to alternative safe and effective life-saving protocols. So, um, furthermore, according to data published by Johns Hopkins University, the COVID-19 has a US mortality rate about 1%. So why are we radically altering our lives and compromising our children's health by requiring them to be injected with these experimental gene therapies? Fine. Thank you. Next speaker is Danny Blunk. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, it's so interesting. A lot of students showing up today talking about masks and the school's rules, you know, and it made me question how come they all showed up in one day? And also, where is the critical thinker of the students? They not, not looking everywhere. Uh, and I doubt that they really think that way. So I'm wondering if they're getting some uh, community service hours to be here. Uh, excuse me? Uh Ma'am, uh, you need to, if you're going to make a public comment, it's not supposed to be commenting on the other speakers. Okay. So, okay. Then I'm going to change my topic now. And I'm going to ask you that. I'm, I'm here. Okay. I'm going to change my subject. And I'm going to ask you if one of your students that you have in your hands gets hurt by this experimental, vac what you call vaccine, the experimental treatment gets hurt, how are we gonna sleep at night? Because there is out there showing there is people getting hurt, you're just not looking at, and you sp you're pushing everything that uh, under to our kids. And that's really not right. Because if you don't think about that, if you don't think how you're gonna feel when someone got hurt, you should not be sitting in this seat because people are getting hurt. You're just not looking in the right place. Thank you. Next speaker is Lucy Oliver. Hi, I'm a sophomore at Dos Pueblos and I'm tired of going to school wearing a mask and being given a hard time for not being vaccinated. Um, all my teachers and friends just have like been very discriminatory about just like me getting the vaccine and not letting me do certain things because I don't have it when I'm with them every single day playing the sport that I play and I'm not allowed to go in certain cars 
and do uh, certain things with people because um, all of this nonsense. Please stop forcing us all to wear masks and take the and take the vaccine. Please let us be educated instead of. Thank you. Next speaker is Carmen Esquivel. Oh, hello. My name is Carmen Esquivel. I'm a mother of three elementary, junior high, and the adult transition program. I am extremely concerned with your mandate. School is supposed to provide the least restrictive environment, and you guys are moving forward to segregation. Instead of moving forward in history, we're moving backward. Also, our children are being informed, misinformed, and glorifying this experimental vaccine. And we are the parents. We are going to be left with the burden of caring for an, a vaccine-injured child. And you're probably going to get more funding for having more special education children, federally and state. Is that what you want? I have a child with special needs. I am a parent of a child that requires attention day and night. And I have friends of children who have been vaccine injured. And for you to be glorifying an experimental vaccine, which you have no knowledge of because they tried to hide it for 55 years in federal court. When you can tell me all the ingredients and all the side effects, I will believe you're on the side of science. You have no information whatsoever it's stop glorifying stop segregating these children stop coercing them and pressuring them it's a lot of work to care for a loved one vaccines don't time next speaker is sophie if you can please state your full name Hi, um, I'm Sophie Sala and I'm a sophomore at Dos Pueblos High School. I am mainly commenting because I want to express appreciation that action has been taken by the district to ensure the health and safety of the student body. Mask mandates, mandatory testing, random testing, extended vaccine access, and other similar actions have all helped my peers and myself feel safer attending school in person during this pandemic. I thank the board and the district for their support and hope they continue to take action to ensure the protection of students' health and well-being. Uh, I wanted to note that everyone I've talked to has is okay with wearing masks and is happy that we are creating a safe environment at school and it's really encouraging and please keep up um, the good work with the public health. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharon Jigotka. Hi, um, I'm a parent of two boys. Um, my son was recently a student at Dos Pueblos High School, and we just recently um, removed him there and because of the environment. It was a toxic environment for him. Two of his teachers made him feel... Um, uh, very bad for his his mask maybe slipping off under his nose or maybe it being under his chin. My son couldn't breathe. So now we've had to pull him out from, from school just because of this uh, mask mandate. Also, with all these young um, students speaking, they are definitely brainwashed. If you go to the public uh, high school, you see all these kids walking outside with their masks on. It's because they are being forced to. It's because they are being brainwashed by their teachers by the media and even by you, the school board. Okay, these kids are not thinking for themselves. You are thinking for them. And we, you're supposed, you want them to think critically, but they're not. They're walking in fear because they're afraid that they're gonna get in trouble if they don't have their mask on or if it's below their nose or if it's on their chin. They're doing these things because they wanna play sports, because they wanna uh, be with their friends, because they wanna be, be in school. It's coercion. You are forcing these children to do things that they really don't want to do. If they had the choice to not wear a mask tomorrow, they probably wouldn't. But the fear mongering, it, it's out of control. I mean, the damage that you're going to do to these kids in the long run, I mean, we don't know. What's, we don't know. Only God knows. Time. Next speaker is Barbara Battistini. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just here to say that this mask mandate is a downward slide for our children. And I'm just appalled by it because I am keeping up with the science. I don't think you are. If we don't stop this insanity, next we will be giving 12 year olds the rights to vaccinate, to choose their own vaccination um, without their parents' um, permission. So, this is once again taking parental rights away from children, from um, our families, and giving them to our kids. And that again is another downward slide. I see right here in an article um, that Laura and Kate, that you have an article on in the Independent and the title, I haven't had a chance to read it, but it says it's time to require vaccines. Um, our students, teachers and staff deserve health and safety and safe schools. And again, this is what it's all leading up to. And we know that you've been funded great amounts of money and your hands are kind of tied because you've been bought. We're really appalled by that as a community. And I think the kids need to hear this. I think the parents need to hear this. I think we need to open our eyes and see what's really going on behind the scenes. I'd like to um, share with you really quick before you inject your child. This is by Robert Malone, a decision that is irreversible. Irrevis irreversible. I wanted to let you know the scientific facts about the genetic vaccine, which is based on the mRNA vaccine technology. I created. So he created this. Time. President Munoz, that concludes public comment on this item. Uh, thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Okay, um, at this time, I'd like to um, move on to the acceptance of donations. And, oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, um, board comment on this item. Apologies. Uh, Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Vance, thank you for the report. And I must say that I I'm, want to share my gratitude. I feel so strongly that I have seen nothing but hard work and care for staff and students in the past few weeks, especially with all the changes and the ways that you've had to pivot. I salute the frontline health workers and I salute the frontline school workers. That's all of those. Uh, teachers and staff members and everyone in the district office who is trying to make and keep our kids safe. So thank you. I also appreciated your use of the word pivot because this is something I've seen done so skillfully uh, with tremendous uh, it, hundreds of hours of work to do so, but responding to science and all the information that we have as it comes available. Um, and just last week, the district really pivoted uh, based on the guidelines and uh, the science and information they had pivoted on uh, the guidelines for overnight field trips. And I wonder if you could sort of just describe that pivot. Sure. So we realized that um, it's important to make sure that uh, students and staff are safe, especially if they're going on field trips, overnight field trips. We realized that uh, that we could look at the policy and make sure that they're they're being tested. The question was, would it only be vaccinated students who could participate with the field trip? And we we realized that actually it's we should follow the policy that we're doing with our students, with which is making sure that they're safe. So we're testing them, uh, testing them before the trip, or making sure they're vaccinated. One of the two. So that's what it is. So it's not a requirement to be vaccinated in order to go on a field trip. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Caps. Friends and to the staff, I wanted to pick up on the word you use, big lift, because that is so clear that there has been such a massive lift amongst teachers, staff, administrators, health professionals to test all of our students. And I just, um, I had a reoccurring questions and comments from parents the last two weeks. One was to thank us for testing at a time when really it was hard, it still is hard to get tests at your local pharmacies uh, and other sources. Our schools were plentiful with testing. And again, that, that had required a lot of forward thinking on this, the part of many, as well as those who are actually administering those. Um, uh, so thank you for that big lift, not just you, Mr. Vince, but all of the 
many, many people in our, um, on our campuses who are doing that on a regular basis, as well as these vaccine clinics. Uh, the second question I've been getting or comment I've been getting is, you know, please let us know, tell us, is there a chance of going remote? And I know this was stated last meeting, but I, and I believe, and I applaud, uh, Dr. Maldonado for explaining it clearly in the Montecito Journal, but I do think it bears repeating that the state legislature passed a law that does not allow uh, California public schools to, to move to distance learning at this time. Um, and I just, again, I, that's the question that keeps coming up for me amongst uh, parents who've reached out. So I just want to let uh, express that here publicly because I think it's a very important point as you know we continue to see such high numbers, although they are moving in the right direction, uh, that this is this is <laughs> as much as we are pivoting, we are staying in school and that's uh, really important to express. So um, thank you on those fronts and uh, President Munoz, back to you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Caps. Uh, Ms. Alvarez. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Vance, and thank you to all the team. Thank you to all the people at the school sites, the classified employees, the admin, the teachers, everyone who makes this happen. Uh, and looking at the numbers that you showed there on your slide, it, it's like Ms. Uh, Susan Roth uh, Klein Child said, it, the numbers really speak for themselves. I mean, it was expected that we were going to see a high increase returning from winter break. And looking at the numbers that you gave us, the week when we returned from winter break, the week of the 3rd to the 7th, we had about a 9% positivity rate mm -hmm. in our district, our students. The following week, uh, from the 14th to the 20th, we have a 3%. So that's about a 6% drop. So we, we, whatever, what we are doing is working. The fact that the students are wearing their mask, that there's this effort to get the testing done, the coordination from, to get the test from the California Department of Public Health, we can see that the numbers speak from the, for themselves. It is working, the schools are open. And I want to share a quick experience, I think last week, I called the district office and I called the business office. And uh, to my surprise, they weren't there. <laughs> and when I found out where, where, where are they, they were at the sites helping with the testing. I mean, that's the effort that is taken from everyone, from the school district to the sites because of the care because it works, the testing works. And, and thank you, thank you, Dr. Maldonado, for your leadership, for, for changing, for pivoting, whatever we wanna call it, thank you. And also a big uh, thank you to the Family Engagement Unit. I, I know Dr. Maldonado mentioned in one of her letters that the Family Engagement Unit has been extremely busy with phone calls in English and Spanish supporting our family, so thank you, thank you for that service. And then one last question. Are we providing N95 masks for our staff and our students? Yes, we are. That, okay. that is definitely the case. Okay, so. thank you. Yes, thank you. Mr. Kelly? Uh, yeah, for, I would just like to echo everything that the students have said. Um, obviously, no one likes wearing masks. They're not that comfortable. But I have not met a student or seen a student that feels unsafe because they're wearing a mask. This is not a concern uh, among a vast majority of the student body. Like, I actually couldn't name anyone. Um, and yeah, shout out to all of the students that are public commenting and all of the members of the public. Uh, any opinion is necessary, and I'm really grateful for people sharing them. Uh, one thing I've noticed with testing in schools, and maybe this is just like the nature of like being efficient, uh, when people are tested, they've been called out of class publicly. It's a, it's kind of subtle. It's like they just say your name and you walk out, but people kind of know like, oh, that person tested positive. Is there anything we can do about this or is it just kind of what has to happen? Um, that's a great question. And I, what we've noticed is actually we, we did various types of tests. So for example, one is that if someone's being tested, the class goes back to their, their classroom 
and then you you're asking for the student to come out um, uh, or we would also see that we have a group of students so for example at Santa Barbara High School where where we were involved with testing directly the, the students what we noticed is that they had the testing station and um, and then all the students would test with that particular class and they would stay there outside as they're waiting for the test results and even so we were very discreet in terms of trying to bring the students over who were positive so we would contact the teacher and they bring the student over but our students are smart I mean it's hard to like try to do this in a way that's very discreet and the other part is I feel like one of the things I've noticed is that the students it's it, they don't I, I've talked to them because I've also been walking with them to class and, and this is just totally anecdotal but it feels like they they understand what's going on and they don't feel like they're being singled out for any reason especially with the number of students that we have as well can I just add uh, that we, we will look into it and talk to our principals about it because if that is the case we want to make sure that we do it in a more tactful way so uh, we'll also in addition to it uh, Mr. Vance to say that we will follow up with our principals and yes. see how we can do better around that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, if there are no other comments. Uh, no oh, comment. I'm sorry, Ms. Sims Moten. Yeah, I, just, I don't need to repeat everything uh, all of my colleagues have said, uh, but Mr. Vance, I wanna say thank you. Again, it's thank you to all everyone who's keeping us safe, keeping our students in, keeping it as normal as possible as we can. And I just, I just appreciate the navigating that we're gonna have to continue to do until we get this under control. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, yes, and just appreciate also um, echoing what my fellow board members are saying. You know, thank you so much for the effort on everyone's part in this. And I know as a community, we can do this together. Uh, thank you. President Munoz, if I may jump in for a second. I just want to also reiterate my gratitude to our principals who have been our frontline managers uh, along with their support staff in all of these pivots and lifts. Without them being there uh, at the front lines, we couldn't pull all of this off. And it's everybody, all hands on deck, but a special shout out to our principals and their support staff. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to uh, acknowledge the donations that are made to the school district. Um, there are several donations that were made to Goleta Valley Junior High for especially for money where it's needed the most and also to the ASB Arts Club. There's a donation that was made to the Dos Pueblos Engineering by the Dos Pueblos Engineering Academy Foundation. Um, and, and that one we will go into when that agenda item it has come up and certainly very grateful for that um, significant donation for our community and our students. Yep. So moved with gratitude, we accept the donations. Okay. Second. Uh, uh, board members, um, sorry. <laughs> um, if, you, if you are in agreement with this, um, please answer, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, I and the um, action item passes unanimously. Okay, um, at this the public hearing. yes, at this time we'd like to hold a public hearing, the fourth public hearing about the map trustee area scenarios selection of three final maps for consideration, and we have a presentation by Cooperative Strategies, um, Mr. Scott Newell. Ms. Trujillo, can you confirm that Mr. Newell is on the line? Yes, he should be uh, online. One moment.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you for having me. I am going to, at least for the presentation part, um, turn off my video so I can look at my bigger sheet over here and uh, focus on, on that. So uh, next slide, please. So here we are again, as we mentioned, our fourth uh, public meeting right now to discuss the creation of trustee areas. Um, just quickly going over our calendar real quick, you can see that we are on the 25th now. Uh, over the last month, we've had one community meeting. And then uh, mid-December, we opened up a virtual uh, map creation tool, both for a five trustee area and a seven trustee area. And that was on the district website. And during that month, um, we had one submittal for a five trustee area and a seven that just identified some communities of interest. And we discussed those at the uh, community meeting on the 13th. And so we'll go over that one scenario today. And then really just uh, a review of the scenarios that we've generated thus far. And, and those are ones that you've had now for quite some time. And then uh, talk a little bit about next steps. So next slide, please. Just a refresh for everybody. Uh, when looking at all of these, these first two bullets up top are ones that are of the utmost importance because they are required. Um, when creating these trustee areas, each trustee area should contain nearly an equal number of inhabitants. And we identify that through a variance. And then the second one, uh, that they are drawn to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, which identifies protected classes and their ability to elect a candidate of their choice. The remaining bullets here, uh, we've kind of discussed at length, and these are good considerations, uh, compact and contiguous as much as possible, drawn to respect communities of interest if possible, follow man-made uh, items such as major interstates, uh, natural geographic features such as a uh, mountain range uh, or river, respect incumbency if possible, and then other local considerations, which uh, one that had been recurring during the course of this project here was the current school sites. Next slide, please. So just a quick review of the data we're using. We are using the 2020 census data which you can see that the school district itself uh, has about 190,000 inhabitants uh, of those um, approximately 160 over the age of 18. And next slide. And then the other data point we use is CVAP or citizen voting age population, uh, which again identifies the individuals that are of the age to vote within the district. And you can kind of see on the map just a heat map of our highest protected class here and you can see some of the figures on the right. Next slide, just a quick refresh from uh, 2010 census. You've grown about 7,000 people, and then you can see how your population demographic has changed on the right. Um, in the future, the next time the census data comes out, all these figures would be updated, and uh, that would be your next opportunity to go through this process again. All right, so go ahead to the next slide here. As I mentioned, um, we had one submittal for a five trustee scenario um, during the course of the month and the time frame that we had um, the tool open for submissions. And so I'm going to go ahead and show that to you. Uh, since we didn't create it, I can kind of talk high level of what we observed and talk about some of the data points that you'll see there. And then we'll go ahead and go through um, the remaining ones. So next slide, please. So here you can see um, a few different things. So the population balance, which if you recall is kind of that first metric, um, the calculated variance here was 4.5%, which is very good. And again, that is the um, variance or the range between your smallest uh, population size and your largest. So in the case of this here, you can see that the pink is the smallest density and then the blue down in the city is your highest density. And so what this um, map has done by doing that, uh, by race, um, just from a population standpoint, you can see in the blue, uh, they were able to create a minority majority from a population standpoint. When you look at the 
uh, citizen voting age population, which again is the population that can actually vote, you have 37.9%. Uh, compared to our scenarios of what we would consider the closest trustee area that we drew to that same blue one, um, in one of our scenarios, we had about 27% in that same category there. Um, and then as you can see, when you scroll down the rest in the orange section there, um, we have 11.8% for CVAP for our Hispanic population. And then in the aqua green color there, 21.2%. Um, in the dark green, 25.1%. And in the pink, um, I'm sorry, yes, in the uh, pink there, 18.1. Um, and so what we kind of noticed on this one, this map um, appears to be drawn to really maximize those first two considerations, um, get a variance that was acceptable from a population standpoint and drawn in a way that it could maximize protected classes ability to elect uh, a candidate they're choosing. One of the things that I just decided to look at because it was discussed at uh, multiple previous meetings is, is school sites. And so uh, when looking at this, there is a distribution of school sites across all uh, trustee areas. We've got three within the Santa Barbara Elementary District. I will say that in the kind of dark green color, we don't appear to have any school sites there. Um, but as I said, it, it appears that this one was really drawn to focus on those first two um, major considerations. You can see some run lines that run um, along the elementary boundaries. Um, and that's, that's how this one has shook out. So it, it does meet uh, you know, the requirements that are, that are in law and um, a pretty good distribution as well for number two. So next slide, please. I'm gonna go through just a quick kind of review of the ones that we've, we've had on the um, website for quite some time here. So first one, uh, when we drew, uh, next slide, please. When we drew this first one here, um, one of the, the you know, major considerations was just a, a distribution uh, of both the first classes, what was, or excuse me, the first considerations. What uh, kind of came up in conversation is that in this particular scenario here, we had three of the trust areas within the Santa Barbara Unified Elementary District and um, you know, made some scenarios that could maybe get more uh, inside there. So next slide, please. The variance on this one was at 6.9. Um, and then you can see from a spread here, um, Trust area number two, we had 24.4%, and then relatively equal distribution across the CBAP for our Hispanic population. Next slide. So with this one, we tried to get as many trust areas as we could uh, to have representation within Santa Barbara Unified. And uh, that was achieved here. However, if you do look at trust area number four, which is the blue, um, we didn't have any school sites uh, located in this trustee area here. And so um, when you look at the numbers, we got the lowest variance. Um, next slide, please. We got the lowest variance here at that time of 3.6%. So we had a very equal distribution of inhabitants. Uh, we were able to influence uh, trustee area number two's CVAP and bump that up a little bit while still maintaining a pretty good distribution across uh, the Hispanic population in each trustee area. Next slide, please. So with this one here, uh, again, we're able to get four of the trustee areas within Santa Barbara Unified, and we were able to then uh, start getting some of the school site sites more equally distributed here. Um, if you look at the numbers, variance is at 4.2. We were, or sorry, next slide, please. Variance was at 4.2. Uh, we're able to kind of further refine uh, trustee area number two and move it up a little bit further. And that did come uh, at a cost a little bit to trustee area number three, but overall um, had some positive impacts there. Next slide, please. 
Um, so we were asked uh, during the process to make some scenarios with four trustees. And so this was one of those scenarios there. And uh, this one, when discussed, was really looking at adhering to um, trying to get a, a school site in each trustee area, uh, again, trying to maintain four or as many as we could trustees within the elementary district. And, um, you know, this one, what we heard from community meetings as well as there was some um, favoritism over the other scenario because this one also ran the Hope and Goleta boundary line. When you look at the variance here, next slide, please. We have a 5% variance. Um, the spreads are obviously different now because we're looking at seven. So trustee area number two, which in this case was the, the green portion, which is a, around the city again, uh, was bumped up to 42.5. Uh, we did see that trustee area number one was much lower um, relative to other scenarios we've seen and a fairly decent spread across the board at that point. Next slide, please. We had a request to refine um, one of our scenarios uh, for trustee area number five to see if we could further enhance the school distribution and also make impacts to uh, the variance and the CVAP numbers, and that was the result of this one here. And so uh, compared to the other five scenarios, this one has um, probably the best distribution of school sites. Um, and then if you were to flip the slide and look at the numbers, we have a pretty good variance at 3.8. Next slide, please. And for our five scenarios, we also um, had the highest CVAP percentage in trustee area number two under this scenario as well at 27.5. And a pretty good distribution with the other trustee areas. Next slide, please. So our last scenario here um, was scenario number six, which was another run for um, the seven trustee areas. And so this one, um, the numbers are pretty similar um, from the last one. However, uh, one of the differences you can see primarily uh, in the middle is that the way these trust areas shook out, um, there were fewer school sites. Uh, there, were, there were none in the purple, which is number five up there. Um, and so that was one of the comments when, when this first one was presented to refine it to see about those school sites. If you go to the next slide, the variance was 6.3. And again, if you look at the CVAP numbers, uh, they're relatively similar to the other uh, trustee area number seven scenario that we, we showed with 42% being the highest in trustee area number two and uh, relatively similar figures in the other uh, categories there. Next slide, please. And so we've come to a, a point in this process where um, we need to start thinking about making a decision so that we can meet the timelines that are in front of us for getting this approved. And so um, I wanted to just outline some recommendations. Now, again, um, these are just my thoughts. You as the board can, can do uh, you know, whatever process you want. So please go to the next slide here. So, you know, right now, uh, effectively in front of you, we have seven scenarios, which is, which is a lot. Uh, it's a lot to consider too, if you were to uh, have a board member make a motion and have discussion and try to narrow it down um, at a final, final vote. So, you know, the recommendation I kind of put forth at least for consideration tonight was to create a short list, if you will. And um, that could be two, three, it could be all of them if you, if you so chose. And during that time between now and the last meeting, um, ask any remaining questions, have any conversations with the public that you need um, so that you're prepared to really make a decision that's going to be formalized for, for you know, the next several years. And so, um, you know, some things that you might consider when thinking about what a short list means to you, uh, just your, your appetite or feelings towards a five or a seven, or if you'd still like to consider both, um, simply put, if there's any that you just, you just don't like, 
Um, so you wouldn't consider them in, in the final anyways. Those are usually easy ones to say, we're gonna put those aside and really focus on these certain ones over here. Um, you know, and anything else that, that you might have questions on right now. And so um, what I tried to at least do here, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, you know, real estate's minimal on these presentations, but I tried to kind of at least lay them out um, all as a side by side. So you can just get a visual of where these different trusty areas lie. So you can just geographically look at it and say, does this you know, represent all those considerations we talked about, um, just seeing everything at once and put you know, our variances on there. It was very difficult to put all the data on there. We can certainly cross-reference those if we need to. Um, and then did the same thing on the next slide for your, um, for your two sevens as well, just to kind of give that, that high level look. And so, you know, with that, I, I'm here for any questions you might have or uh, any additional thoughts. Yes, um, thank you so much. We're gonna go to public comment now. Um, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any comments on this item? Thank you, President Munoz. We do have public comment and I will start with Moni Duet. Yeah, hi, good evening board. And thank you so much, Sandy. Um, uh, just briefly, I would like to support both number four and six. I um, feel that it would really be an advantage for our district to have seven board members. One of the things I'm, I'm thinking about are comments from the New York Chancellor of Education, David Banks, and he focuses a lot on equity and inclusivity as well for our area has some similar issues around socioeconomics. So by having seven people, we could, for example, have a board member who represented students with learning differences or a board member who had experience with that or a board member from socioeconomic hardship or also more diversity on our board because our enrollment is 80% minority. And um, when you look at uh, being inclusive, we have 88% of the special ed kids aren't meeting the standards in literacy. 46% of the English language or dual language learners aren't meeting it. And 61% of our students are at economic disadvantage. So the bigger the board, we could include voices from these areas, and these are the most vulnerable areas that are, are hurting the most painfully low scores. So this would be a more inclusive education. And um, we also do need to get rid of balanced literacy. And I encourage you all to listen to David Banks. He's um, an attorney and educator of color, and he's all about equity and his solutions about reading are, could be powerful for our district. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker is Alice Post. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Alice Post and I've written a letter to you that seven trustees is best. And I hope you've read my points. I have about five points and I won't have time in a minute and a half to go through them, but um, they're basically walk a mile in my moccasins. I want a trustee that lives where I live. Um, I'm, the issue of these school sites, I don't think that's the priority. You wear two hats, you wear the Santa Barbara Elementary School hat, and you wear the, the Santa Barbara Secondary School hat. And we elect reasonable people who are good people, and I trust them to take off their secondary hat and put on their elementary hat and represent my district. I want as many uh, trustee areas in Santa Barbara Elementary District as possible. And all the maps of five only have one, and that's not acceptable. So in order to have at least two or three, you have to have a map of seven. And lastly, the Coalition for Neighborhood Schools created a new map in response to the equity map, which is an equity map with seven. And I want you to put it into the public record and I hope it can be discussed tonight. Um, we think that it, it, it is superior to the equity map and its numbers 
for Hispanic CVAP are better in every um, measure. It has three districts that are highly Hispanic and better numbers. Thank you. Next speaker is Daniel Gonzalez. Uh, hello, Board of Trustees. Uh, my name is Daniel Gonzalez, Organizing Director with Future Leaders of America. I'm here today to support uh, the equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA. Um, our equity map most accurately represents the protected class in Santa Barbara, as well as ensure that the voices and needs are being heard rather than overshadowed by more affluent communities. The school board should not adopt a seven district map. A seven district map would have a negative impact on a school district that is majority Latinx the needs of our BIPOC youth are not going to be met if we further break the district into even more super wealthy classes districts. Placing communities that share no similarities or struggles together only serves to dilute the voting power of the protected class. Also, a seven district map will create a system that incentivizes the needs of a certain district over the entire school district. According to the, C uh, the California Voting Rights Act, uh, redistricting must consider communities of interest. Uh, must consider communities of interest. The east side and the west side share a community of interest in that they are neighborhoods with high levels of English language learners, students, students facing digital access issues, students in free and reduced lunch, and first generation students. So they have a shared interest in being in the same district. Our equity map creates two districts out of five where nearly half of the voters are people of color. In a majority of students of color school district, we need a district map that will guarantee, guarantee a strong voice for our communities for the next decade. Hi. Next speaker is Sheridan Rosenberg. Thank you. Can you hear me, Sandra? Yes. Thank you. Hi. Well, obviously, um, I'm in support of scenario six with seven trustees for a whole constellation of reasons. But really what I'd like to do is just explain what I've observed personally as a parent. I lived in the Monroe School District. We were delighted to walk our daughter to school. My son went to Laguna all 13 years of school and my husband and I believe in public education. We moved into a neighborhood where we could walk our daughter to school. And what we saw was really, uh, was really terrible. We saw that most of the kids at the school were being bused from the east side. There is nothing more racist and outdated like from the 70s than busing children an hour each way out of their own neighborhoods to a different neighborhood. The sin was unifying the school district, number one, it made it too big and unruly. And people who lived near their neighborhood schools, some of them no longer had neighborhood schools. What I see is that we need to go back to the restoration of that east side school, I believe it was Lincoln, Monroe could certainly be a wonderful magnet school. Scenario six with seven trustees at least will give broader representation, more voices. And uh, while we certainly can't reverse the unification of the school district, which was a disaster, I want to point out that the school districts that everybody wants to get their kids into, Hope, Montecito, Cold Spring, they're tiny because that works. That's why, at least, if you're not going to break up the district, give more representation. Right. Next speaker is Alan Evenstein. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Members of the board, thank you for your time and service. Um, I noted your consultant's statement that, quote, you as a board can do whatever you want. And, and that deserves emphasis. Um, at this point in time, I think it's concerning that there was only one map from the community submitted. That, that speaks to some breakdown in the process. Um, other circumstances with other government agencies have had dozens of maps, and that came from changing when the decision was going to be made and other factors. Some of that's beyond the board's control, but what is within your control is considering variants of the maps that have already been submitted. And I think that a variant of map six, I think it's vital that in the final process, you have both a five district map and a seven district map. There's variants of, of map six that have been proposed that would have a variance of 1.3% 
a CVAP, a Latino CVAP of 48.1%, the East and West Side united in one district, and Isla Vista UCSB and Old Town Goleta united in one district. Um, I would encourage you to consider those options. The seven proposal grew out of a CVRA challenge. I think you should go with the district's proposal that has the highest Latino CVAP, which would be a variant of District 6. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker is Peggy Wilson. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I um, in, am in support of MAP 6 for all the reasons that have been stated, I think already. I think I would like to add that um, more uh, voices speaking into this are better than uh, few and that the goal is for the kids and their literacy of reading and math to be a lot better than what it is now. There was also a survey at the end of the year which showed a dissatisfaction of teachers with this current administration and map six with seven trustee areas um, would go a long way with bridging the classroom and the boardroom. So I do support uh, map six and thank you for taking my comment. Thank you, next speaker is Christian Alonso. Good evening, Board President Munoz and Board Trustees. My name is Christian Alonso and I'm the Director of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood Central Coast Action Fund. The Action Fund is here tonight to show our support for the equity map submitted by CAUSE and the Future Leaders of America. Education is critical to the mission of Planned Parenthood and we are proud of our bilingual community health educators that provide medically accurate, inclusive sex education and information to adults, teens and families throughout Santa Barbara Ventura and San Luis Obispo counties to help them make healthy decisions that are necessary to building a strong future. As others have said tonight, we need to create fair districts to ensure all voices are heard. In the spirit of complying with the California Voting Rights Act, we agree with others that seven districts, as some of the maps propose, is too many and runs the risk of diluting the voice of historically underrepresented students, parents, and families. We support the equity map because it proposes five distinct districts that are reflective of the rich diversity of our neighborhoods and various communities of interest here in Santa Barbara. Some of the other proposed maps could result in the separation of neighbors and families like those that reside on the Santa Barbara East side, the West side and the Mesa. The equity map will keep those families together and will also combine similar demographic neighborhoods like those in Old Town, Goleta, Goleta and Isla Vista. Planned Parenthood Central Coast Action Fund is committed to creating healthier communities through education, and we are grateful for our partnership with the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Thank you for your time this evening, and please consider the equity map to deliver fair representation to our students, parents, faculty, and staff in the district. Thank you. The next speaker is Future Leaders. If you can please state your full, full name. Hello, <clears throat> um, my name is Lay. Um, hi, board members. Um, I'm here to support the equity map submitted by cause slash FLA. The equity map most accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes. It also ensures that their voices are not drowned out by more affluent communities. In accordance with the California Voting Rights Act, redistricting must consider communities of interest. The east side and the west side share a community of interest in that they are neighborhoods with high levels of English language learners, students facing digital access issues, students on free and reduced lunch, and first generation students. They have a shared interest in being in the same district. To divide our neighborhoods from one another and placing them with wealthier areas such as the Riviera or the Mesa would be voter dilution that would hurt our communities, drown out our voices and take, out, take away our representation. Additionally, the largest concentration of people of color in the district is Old Town Goleta and La Vista, which also should be combined together. These communities of interest have similarities of being racially diverse with many immigrants, renters and low income households. They shouldn't be put with the hills of Goleta or Hope Ranch, which are much more affluent. This would be voter dilution and diminish our voices. Seven districts will hurt our communities even more by dividing up more um, our minority communities and giving up more seats to affluent ones. I urge you all to support the equity map, which has five districts in order to create fair boundaries and to ensure that all voices are heard. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lauren Quintet. 
Hello, my name is Lauren Quande. I'm a parent, community member, and also an alumni of this district. Um, I'm here to show my support for the equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA because it most accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes. The Latinx community makes up the majority of the school district, and I urge you to do everything in your power to make sure their voices will be heard. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Greg Hamill. Hi, um, but, uh, I recommend map six, mostly due to the fact that it has three districts in Goleta, three districts in Santa Barbara, and one in the Hope School, and that represents the community um, pretty balanced. And also the districts in Goleta are very um, balanced with respect to Anglo and Hispanic uh, ratios. Uh, I wanted to speak uh, also about the FLOA process. My son was invited to attend the FLOA meeting. He was not able to get in. Um, he was kept trying to get in. I got into the meeting and I was kicked out by Daniel Gonzalez because we didn't, there was no open thought in that meeting. It was only one point of view allowed. And when that point of view was not held, I was kicked out and my son was not allowed in. And my son wrote Daniel Gonzalez an email saying, why did you kick me out? And he got no response. So this flow of thing is a joke. It's scripted writing for all these kids who really can't express their own thoughts. They're not allowed. If they think differently, if they don't march lockstep with Daniel Gonzalez and cause. And, and this is a public, um, this is, they're, they're using this in high school. So my son has every right to be in that meeting as the other kids, just because he may have different thoughts. And that is un-American. Good night. Thank you. Next speaker is Todd Amspoker. Good evening. My name is Todd Amspoker. I'm an attorney with Price Postel and Parma here in Santa Barbara. I wrote a letter earlier on behalf of the Coalition for Neighborhood Schools. I'm commenting on the memo that's provided in the record from Griffith and Thornburg. It's a very unusual memo. Um, I don't think it should be relied on by the board for any purpose. I, I've been representing public agencies for 35 years, including counties, cities, special districts, public utilities, and school districts. I've written innumerable memos to my clients, obviously. I've never written a memo like this to my clients. The memo doesn't appear to be providing legal advice relative to whether there should be a five district or seven district scenario. It's providing policy advice on this issue. I've never given my clients advice about the merits of a policy decision. I provide legal advice. It's not my job to do anything else. Not only have I never provided such a memo to my clients, I've never been asked to provide such advice by my clients. If I were asked to provide such advice, I would say I'm uncomfortable to do so. It's not my job as an attorney. So the question I have is who asked district council to provide an opinion about policy that the district board is considering tonight? I think you have a duty to let the public know how this came about that the only written presentation regarding the policy implications of this matter is coming from district council. Other presenters have already explained why the policy suggestions in the memo are wrong. It's not my job. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Gloria Soto. Good evening, board. My name is Gloria Soto. I'm the executive director at Future Leaders of, of America, and I'm here today um, to speak in support of our equity map that was recently published in partnership with, with CAUSE. Our equity map um, arranges the district into five regions that can fairly create minority majority districts and give people of color a fair opportunity at electing their candidate of choosing as mandated by the California Voting Rights Act. The Board of Trustees has an opportunity to right the wrongs by favoring a map with five districts that fairly, uh, fairly and appropriately um, uh, uplifts communities of interest. However, it is no surprise that a five member district has been antagonized by right wing group, groups. In a recent opinion piece published by The Independent, argues that seven districts will have the pathway for neighboring schools and close the academic achievement gap. 
This analysis is completely wronged and wrong and misinformed. Although veiled as a way to address the academic achievement gap, it is no more than a right wing tactic used across the nation. Moreover, it does not equate to equity, nor is it going to address the academic achievement gap. By dividing the district into seven regions, the opportunity to create a minority majority district fades. All the seven, all seven district maps um, currently displayed um, unfairly disenfranchises low income community. Thank you. Next speaker is Michelle WQ. Please state your full name. Good evening, thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Michelle Westander Quaid and I live in Santa Barbara. Regarding the new school districting, I support map six because it creates seven trustee areas. I also wanted to add, I'm concerned because this is supposed to be a citizen driven activity. So it's disturbing to see that special interest groups like cause have submitted maps. They did the same thing for the supervisor redistricting, but ultimately a citizen driven map was selected for the new supervisor districts. And that should be the case here. The opportunity to create seven trustee areas instead of five has many advantages. Seven trustee areas are best because that will promote more engagement of neighborhood schools with their trustee representative, which is foundational in the neighborhood school concept. The biggest winners I see would be the students, parents, and teachers. Each of these areas presented on the map has unique characteristics. The seven small areas will enable parents, teachers, and students to work more closely together to close the achievement gap among students. So I ask that you please support map six with the seven trustee areas. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Somar Saman. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, my name is Somar Samana Aparicio, and I am a student from San Marcos High School. My family and I have lived in Santa Barbara for the past five years. I'm here to show my support in approving our equity map submitted by Haas and FLA because it most accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes. The immigrant community is over 60% of the district, and we need to create fair boundaries to ensure all the voices are heard. Grouping, grouping affluent neighborhoods with low-income neighborhoods would diminish the voices of the protected class and create underrepresentation. For example, scenario one, two, two A, and three puts the part of the west side, a low-income set of neighborhoods with the Mesa neighborhood, which has affluent families that have high income. It also combines the east side, low-income neighborhoods with the Rivera wealthy homeowners. This is an issue because it muffles the voice of the working class, immigrant families, and people of color. Affluent neighborhoods are most likely to be involved in local politics. If our communities are divided, it would further drown out the voices of the working class. Affluent families and working class families have different issues. This is important to me because I come from a working class family and I want to make sure other working class families like mine are equally represented on your board. We want our, the voices not to be silenced. And thank you for listening. Thank you. The next speaker is Roseanne Crawford. Good evening. This is Roseanne Crawford. I support all seven trustee areas, particularly that the map recently submitted by the Coalition to Preserve Mission Canyon. Oh, excuse me, the, the wrong coalition. Uh, the Coalition for Neighborhood Schools. This is best for supporting the neighborhood schools. It amplifies Latinos' voices because they are represented in East Side, West Side, Goleta, and Isla Vista. Schools don't vote, voters do. Doesn't matter where the schools are. This is a collective board. The CNS map is a modification of map six and gives seven trustee areas. It gives a robust CVAP in all areas and a good variance. Because of the December 14th meeting canceled, for this process taken off the agenda, I think it would merit a special meeting to closely look at this map as compared with the other options presented to you. Better yet, choose this map as one of the three with the map submitted by the public for five. It would be nice to have future leaders of America weigh in on this. I think this is one everyone can be happy with. Let's join hands, leave politics behind and put our kids' education first. More hands are needed on this board. Thank you very much for your consideration. 
Thank you. Next speaker is Lucy Oliver. Hi, I'm a student at DP and I attended the Zoom meeting for Future Leaders of America. It was very interesting because I felt like they were talking very bad about people and telling us things that I found out later were not true. They gave us a script and said we would get co community service for speaking at this school board meeting tonight. They talked about Gary Mandering told, uh, told us how the process works and said they would let us know when to speak. It felt wrong that they were using students for this. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Laura Wilson. Ms. Wilson, can you unmute yourself? Excuse me. I'm Laura Wilson. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and as a member of the Coalition for Neighborhood Schools. A seven trustee district map is superior to a five district map. Seven members equals better representation for every taxpayer, voter, student, and parent. Smaller districts can be better represented by their trustee. Seven members equals a better board. This is a very important point. They're more attuned to the communities of interest, more accessible to their voters, more accountable to the parents and students, more knowledgeable about the district's needs, and therefore more effective as board members. Seven members means each trustee only represents a population of about 27,000 versus 37,000 for a five districts. That smaller number of 27,000 is good for democracy and very good for any future school board candidates in, term of cam in terms of campaign expenses and voter contact. At least one of the maps that goes forward must be for seven trustee districts. Not to seriously consider seven districts would be a mistake when voting rights accountability and representation candidate access are so clearly at stake and important to our school communities and to all the protected classes. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Claire Schneider. Hi, my name is Claire Schneider and I am a senior at Dos Pueblos High School. I support the equity map submitted by Future Leaders of America and CAUSE. Seven districts dilute the voting power of BIPOC communities and favors more affluent slash white voters. We must keep it to five districts. In addition, under the seven trustee configuration, there would be three trustee areas with no district elementary sites and no district elementary population. In order to ensure proper representation, the east side and the west side must be kept together. Glida, Isla Vista, and Old Town Glida also must be kept together. These neighborhoods have similar interests and there's no reason to divide them and drown out their ability to have a voice. Please consider the equity map submitted by Future Leaders of America and Cause. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next speaker is Emily Pineda. Hello, my name is Emily Pineda and I'm a student from Santa Barbara High. My family and I have lived in Santa Barbara for the past 16 years. I'm here to show my support in approving our equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA because it most accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes. The Latinx community is 59.96 of the district and we need to create fair boundaries to ensure all voices are heard. Additionally, we do not support seven district maps because the Latinx communities are split up and coupled with affluent communities that don't share any similarities. This muffles the voices of BIPOC communities it's not only racist, it's classes. It would create additional districts of wealthy white neighborhoods who most likely don't have students that go to SBUSD. This stacks the board against minorities, further creating less representation. This is why I support the equity map, which has five districts and allows for all voices to be heard. Being a student of color from Santa Barbara High and being in the Mad Academy, it's unfortunate that there's not more Latinx representation in the Mad Academy as well. This is a sign that we need more change and more representation. We need a more diverse representation in the Mad Academy and we need it in our school boards. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Luis Catalan.
Hello, my name is Luis Catalan, and I am a student from Santa Barbara High School. I'm here to show my support in approving our equal e equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA because it is more accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes. The BIPOC community deserve to have their voices heard and not this franchise due to com complying poor neighborhoods with rich neighborhoods. For example, residents from the Mesa make millions of dollars to be able to live in houses by the beach. They don't run into the same issues as residents who live in low income neighborhoods. It does not make sense to combine both of these neighborhoods since it would drown out the voices of minorities. Seven districts will hurt our community more by dividing up minority communities and giving more seats to affluent ones. I urge you to support five districts in order to create fair boundaries to ensure all voices are heard. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Melissa Villafuerte. Hello, board members. Uh, my name is Melissa Villafuerte, and I'm here today to show my support in approving the equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA. I'm in favor of this map because it most accurately allows for the proper representation of the protected classes. We must ensure that the Latinx community, which is composed of 59.96% of the district, has fair boundaries, making all voices heard. Just to reiterate, we do not support seven districts because they provide additional seats for upper class and wealthy communities at the expense of drowning out the voices of communities of color. Our equity map has five districts and it is reflective of the needs of youth at SVUSD. In order to ensure proper representation for the Latinx community, we demand that the east side and west side are kept together and that Galita, Isla Vista and Old Town Galita are also kept together. As the historically largest Latinx neighborhoods, the east side and west side should be kept together because students in those communities face similar, similar struggles, including language barriers, housing insecurity, the digital divide, and being first generation students. With equitable redistricting lines, individuals in that community will be able to elect candidates that will not only listen, but also advocate in the favor um, of the communities when making decisions. In accordance with the California Writing Act, California must consider communities of interest for the purpose of effective and fair representation. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Brittany Mendoza. Hello, my name is Brittany Mendoza and I'm a student at San Marcos High School. I was born and raised in Santa Barbara, and I'm here today to show my support in approving our equity map submitted by CAUSE and Future Leaders of America, because I believe it most accurately shows the proper representation of protected classes. The Hispanic community makes up 59.96% of the district. We need to create fair and equal boundaries to ensure all voices are heard and none are drowned out. Grouping affluent neighborhoods with low-income neighborhoods would diminish the voices of the protected class and create underrepresentation. All of the maps provided by the district combine low-income neighborhoods with the affluent neighborhoods that don't share many common interests. We need to combine districts that share common interests and commonalities like the East and West Side who are mostly composed of low-income families and renters. Ultimately, we need to ensure that we create fair and equitable maps that represent operative classes and their interests. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker is Malia Garcia. My name is Malia Garcia. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Malia Garcia and I'm a student for... Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hello, my name is Malia Garcia and I'm a student from Dos Pueblos High School. My family and I have lived in Santa Barbara for the past 15 years. I'm here to show my support in approving our equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA because it most accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes. All the other maps submitted to the Santa Barbara School Board hurt minority communities by dividing them up and combining them with affluent communities. It doesn't make sense to have people who don't share similar backgrounds and issues be in the same district. Galena and Hope Branch should not be put together because they have different income levels and struggles. For example, Hope Branch is known to be an affluent neighborhood with multi-million dollar homes while Galita has many apartment complexes. Here you can visually see how these communities are not similar. Therefore, they shouldn't put Hope Branch with Galita. The maps of seven districts are the most problematic. The seven district maps divide minority communities in favor of affluent ones. This creates less of a voice for minorities and unfairly gives more seats to affluent ones. This is why I support the equity map 
which has five district maps that allow for everyone to have a voice and to be heard. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Next speaker is Metzli Reyes. Hello, my name is Metzli Reyes, and I am here to show my support in approving the equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA because it most accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes. The Latinx community is 59.96% of the district, and we need to create fair boundaries to ensure that all voices are heard. I do not support seven districts because they provide additional seats for upper class and wealthy communities at the expense of drowning out the voices of communities of color. Dividing up the school district into seven, not only would it be inherently racist, but classist as well. Again, the only people that seven districts would benefit would be those in affluent, rich, white neighborhoods whose kids most likely are not attending public schools in our district. In if the goal is to have representatives that accurately advocate and fight for the needs and issues faced by this community, then it is imperative that we do not break up into seven districts and group group minority groups with a majority of rich white neighborhoods as it is the intention in most of these redistricting scenarios, simply because they do not share the same struggles and needs and will suppress the voices of the mostly Latinx community in the school district. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Wendy Benitez. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hello, my name is Wendy Benitez and I'm a student from San Marcos High School. Um, first, I just want to say that Future Leaders of America is no joke. We are a group of students that come from low income, first generation and Latinx communities who work to advocate for ourselves and our community, which is why many of us are here tonight. Um, furthermore, my family and I have lived in Santa Barbara for the past 18 years. Today, I'm here to show my support for our equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA because it most accurately represents proper representation representation for protected classes. The Latinx community is about 60% of the district and we need to create fair boundaries so all voices are heard. I do not support seven districts because they would provide additional seats for the upper class and wealthy communities at the expense of draining out the voices of communities of colors, which would happen because a good amount of our parents, like mine, cannot vote and splitting up these communities will decrease the chances of voting for the members that our communities want. Our equity map has five districts and is reflective of the needs of the youth at Santa Barbara Unified School District. To ensure proper representation of the Latinx community, the east side and the west side should be kept together, while Galita, Isla Vista, and Old Town Galita should also be kept together. These areas are the largest historically Latinx neighborhoods and therefore should be kept together because students face similar struggles such as language barriers, being first generation, and housing insecurity. Keeping these areas together will ensure that someone in the school board will make the best decisions for their community. Having come from this community, they will know what their community needs because they have been a part of it for years. I do not think that someone who has never lived in that community should have the power to make decisions. So I support the five district map. Thank you. Next speaker is Christy Lozano. School board members and Superintendent Maldonado. I'm appalled as a parent and as a teacher that future leaders of America would use my students at DP, San Marcos and Santa Barbara High School, and I have students at all three schools, to solicit other students over social media to speak at tonight's board meeting, just like they've done. And kids, you guys did a really good job. It's just too bad they're using you for political activities because I believe that's against board policy. What student wouldn't read a script for three to four hours of community service? That's the other thing that's going on here. So what do kids know about redistricting? I'm just learning about the redistricting because it only happens every 10 years. And it's even more shameful that future leaders of America would train them, give them a script. I've seen the script. I see they're reading all the lines perfectly and promise them for three to four hours of community service to read it at a school board meeting, which now they've done. I believe, like I said, it's breaking school board policy to do this. Superintendent Maldonado was aware that future leaders of America were training students as one of the future leaders of America referenced the fact that she would try to schedule the public comments for redistricting at the beginning of the meeting so that students don't have to wait so long. As a teacher, can I remind you about the 53 pages of poor review given by the Santa Barbara Unified Teachers? I support the seven trustee district as it will give teachers more of a voice because right now we're not at the table because we've been given a code of silence. Fine. Thank you. 
Next speaker is Resilience Institute. If you can please state your name. My name is Jacqueline Inda, and I am here as a representative of the Senate of the um, School Districts and Policies uh, Committee scheduled and, and here speaking on behalf of what we call the Equity 7 um, maps and what you've been presented with. Um, first of all, I want to thank the future leaders of America for all of their hard work in teaching our kids how to advocate for policy. That's important. What is shameful is the misinformation they've given those students. I have been a leader in district elections throughout this county and other counties, working really hard to create district elections. Now, let me tell you something. When it comes to a map, you need to create voices of Latino community members. That's why my name is behind a lot of these lawsuits. In order to do that, you have to create a 50% population basis for a district. In their maps with only five representatives, highest number they could get is 37. That is voting dilution. And that is why the school district would look at potentially getting sued if they only chose a five member district. And in fact, by listening to all of this process, it's very important and critical that you understand as school board members, that the reason why you would avoid a litigation is if you chose the remedy that would best suit creating majority minority districts. And in a five member district, you do not have that, especially not with 37%. Time. Thank you. Next speaker is Hector Flores Garcia. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Hector Flores Garcia. My family and I have lived in Santa Barbara for the past 20 years. As a proud product of this district, I'm here to show show my support in approving the equity map submitted by CAUSE and FLA. I support this map because it most accurately allows for the proper representation of our protected classes. The Latinx community makes up roughly 60% of the district and we need to create fair boundaries to ensure all our voices are heard. In order to ensure proper representation for the Latinx community, we need the east side and the west side to be kept together. Galita, Ela Vista, and Old Town Galita are to be kept together as well. These neighborhoods have similar interests and there's no reason to divide them and dilute their say in having fair representation. As the largest historical Latinx neighborhoods in the area, the east side and the west side should be kept together because they are communities whose students face so similar, so many similar struggles, including language barriers, housing insecurity, the digital divide, and being first generation students. Lastly, we do not support seven districts because they provide additional seats for the upper class and wealthy communities at the expense of drowning out the voices of our communities of color. The equity map has five districts and is reflective of the needs of the youth at SVUSD, and that's why I support it. Thank you for listening and for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Cressida Silvers. Good evening. I'm a parent at SBUSD and uh, with one child currently in the district and two more starting in 2023. According to the California school, um, the statewide dashboard, the 2021 data, 60% of students at SBUSD schools are Latino and 53% are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So I encourage you to support a trustee map that promotes the strongest representation for the families, for the families of SBUSD rather than maps that favor voters who don't have children or do, but choose not to send them to the local public schools. Trustee maps that split up our Latino communities and combine the resulting parts with predominantly white wealthy communities dilute the voting power and the needs and the ability of the school board to respond to the needs of our SBUSD families and of those protected classes and paves the way for our trustees to be chosen largely by voters who do not have children at SBUSD. So please support a map that keeps the east side and the west side together, that keeps Old Town Goleta and Isla Vista together, and that keeps our board to five trustees so as not to further dilute our current representation. Please support the trustee area map submitted by CAUSE and FLA communities. And thank you, as always, for your continued work for our children. Thank you. Next speaker is Chelsea Lancaster. Hello, um, good evening again. I'm gonna keep this really quickly, uh, really quick. I'm just here to support 
and amplify the equity map that has been brought forward by Future Leaders of America and CAUSE. Um, one way in which we create equity in our communities and, and build power is to allow people to speak for themselves. So I really want uh, folks to be thinking about who is speaking on behalf of whom this evening. I really love hearing the youth who are uh, from these communities uh, amplify their voices and learn how to organize. This is our future. And they're fighting uh, a, a system, a, a politic, a strategy that we're seeing nationwide. Um, so I'm here to amplify that when we're talking about protected classes. Um, again, really need to amplify those voices and empower them to make decisions for themselves and trust their process. And um, Folks keep using the language of minority, but really we're talking about a majority. We're talking about the global majority. We're talking about a majority of students of color in our district um, that deserve to be uh, supported. And we talk about achievement gaps, but really we need to talk about access gaps, opportunity gaps. Um, so I just really want to appreciate all the students that are here tonight and um, appreciate the board for holding this space. And again, just lend my support to the equity maps that are um, really well researched, frankly. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Ana Garcia. Hello. Um, what you are seeing today is youth organizing in our community to advocate for themselves and their families. And what we have are affluent white folks speaking out, trying to discredit and silence them. What you have heard here is what will happen if any map other than the equity map is selected. I support the equity map and oppose any map that has seven trustees as a scenario, because that will continue to erase the communities that we are supposed to be empowering and preventing from uh, being uh, disenfranchised in this process. Please listen to the community who is here telling you what they need. Thank you. Next speaker is Heather Gawana. Mr. Gawana, can you unmute yourself? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, perfect. Everybody, uh, my name is Eder Gawana. Um, as a young child who was bused from the Lower West Side to Washington Elementary, I, came, I am keenly aware of the dynamics playing here, rich versus poor, white versus people of color. Although uncomfortable at Washington, I was offered the best educational experience that a child could have had. However, my mom or I never felt fully represented within the school district. John Lewis once said, getting good trouble and necessary trouble to redeem the soul of our, uh, of our nation. That's why I'm here tonight to voice my support for a five district map. A map of seven trustees will only continue to exacerbate the already large inequalities within the district and continue to divide the district. The equity map fairly submitted by FLA creates minority majority districts that allow low income Latino individuals to duly elect representatives who share their background. Any seven member district will only dilute the ability of communities of interest to elect fair representation. For instance, coupling white affluent neighborhoods with low income Latino neighborhoods. Any seven member map will only advise the right wing propaganda that more is better. And based on the comments tonight, fail to adequately address the Voting Rights Act. At the end, all we're asking for is fair representation and an opportunity to have representation at this board. So board of trustees get in good trouble and vote for fair representation tonight. Have a good night. Thank you. Next speaker is Briggs. If you can please state your full name. If you can unmute yourself. They're not able to connect them and I go to the next speaker, Barbara Battistini. Hi, thank you um, for having me speak. I'd like to agree with a prior speaker who called out the use of students to promote a political gain. Is this legal having nonprofit groups like Future Leaders of America dictating their message to puppet these kids? 
We have seen this before and it is, it, it is shameful. The equity map basically only wants Hispanic voters heard and no others. The rest of the community doesn't seem to matter, but we are all paying taxes no matter what color our skin. And by the way, my family heritage, it comes from Mexico. And my grandparents came here, worked hard and paid their taxes. And I do the same. This equity is really bring this um, equity is really bringing division to our community, or at least the use of this word. And I am appalled that someone is allowing these kids to speak as they are, as puppets. But I would like to say that I support Map 6 because it all because it will create the seven trustee areas. It is important that we have more school board members representing more neighborhoods. Map six will provide the need for more inclusiveness with parents and teachers in more pockets of our community. As both a parent and a teacher, I would like to say that, that encouraging those smaller neighborhood relationships will help build stronger communities and give families a greater sense of belonging while giving them a greater chance to be heard. I am in favor of neighborhood representation and we need seven trustees to do the job right. Thank you for considering this. Good night. Thank you. Next speaker is Zach Kosboom. Hi. I, um, I support the seven equity map uh, redistrict redistricting and I oppose the um, seven trustee scenario um, because it dilutes the Latinx vote. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker is Michael English. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I uh, want to thank you for, uh, for uh, hearing everybody's voices here um, and for the chance to speak tonight. I'm Michael English and I live in Santa Barbara. And since uh, I want to support map six with, uh, area, uh, with the seven trustees, um, I think adding more trustees would promote more inclusiveness with parents and teachers to better serve students. Teachers clearly want to be more involved and are tired of being scapegoats for the lack of learning and by the increasing uh, disciplinary issues. They're not being included in the conversation with the administration and have been bullied into, with a code of silence. A survey at the end of the year shows the dissatisfaction of the teachers they're having with the current administration. Map six with the seven trustee areas will go a long way to bridging the classroom um, to the boardroom. So I appreciate your support of map six with the seven trustees. Thank you. Next speaker is Aries Ivanova. I'm a senior at Dos Pueblos High School and I'm here to support the cause and FLA equity map. Communities of color, which continue to be underserved, deserve representation in our school board. A map with seven districts would separate neighborhoods with similar interests and drown out the voices of working class and minority citizens. Splitting up these neighborhoods and grouping their inhabitants with those of more affluent communities effectively disenfranchises them, which is unacceptable. I would like to add that I am in no way affiliated with CAUSE or FLA, and I am not receiving community service hours for my participation in this meeting. Redistricting and gerrymandering is actually a topic we were required to cover in my AP government and politics class. And once you know how to see it, it's not hard to spot. That is why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Justin Shores. Thank you. I do wanna um, speak to a little bit of the process here. And um, I, I did a, um, I, I thought there was some funny business going with the Supervisor redistricting. So I did a public records request, and this as the same name popped up as it's speaking tonight. Um, she's a, a council member up in Santa Maria, Gloria Soto. That was who Carrie, James Cariaco and Kyle Richards asked for scripts for to do redistricting. So it's she's the same person tonight who's she's in charge of the fund. Um, so who gives gives money gives grant money to future leaders of America. This is all looking really, really political. So all these scripts, they're, they're you know, they're they're great, good, good, you know, getting the kids out to do this. You know, maybe, you know, I don't know why why you're using them, but the bottom line is um, it looks really bad. Um, I just oppose the cause map because I think they were doing the same thing during the redistricting for the county. So it's it looks very uh, lobbied and political and fake. It's not it doesn't look real. 
the scripts are all the same. And it's, it's just really apparent when you're watching it. So um, I would just be really careful because there's now people watching the politics in town. We're, we're, we're paying attention. So be careful. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Kastner. Hi, uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I would like to emphasize what Justin Shores just to, uh, said. Um, this is the most important aspect in a child's education is parental involvement. And this is now becoming all about politics and bureaucracy. And we're losing track that our students every year get lower, lower scores in math and reading, just the basic, the basic things that they should be able to do. And um, this, I'm just going to say, diversity, equity, inclusion, it sounds also nice, but it is a social experiment and has been done before, has been done in... Uh, uh, under communism, and it's 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 currently still in China. It's 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 total indoctrination. I can hear it. There's no independent thinking, no critical thinking. Uh, I think uh, school high school students should read the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. They should learn what uh, history has taught us about these collectivist ideologies, and that. Uh, uh, this is this is going to be a, a road to disaster for our public education. I, it's just it's just stunning what I see happening. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Connie Alexander. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> you know the American education system <clears throat> was really built on a, a very deep segregationist model. And you actually have the opportunity to start to break that. And so by giving and making certain that everyone has the ability to actually speak, has the ability within their communities to come together. If we were really gonna have equity around this thing, first thing we would do is we get rid of that $5,000 where you have to put money on the table to do it. That's equity when you get rid of that. We know that people will move. Whatever maps you put together, they're going to move. They're going to go there. And I want to uplift the students tonight that came on with their civic engagement because that's the very thing we want them to do. People are fine giving them community service hours to sweep their floors, but they are not okay if they come and show and be a part of the community. But if we can narrow that and keep them from learning how to have a voice, then that's okay. So you know the right thing to do. I'm not going to even go there. You know what's right. I believe that you will and that you'll make a good decision tonight that will uplift the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Kim Pascase. Hello, members of the board. My name is Kim Pascage and I'm a parent in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. I would like to voice my support and uplift the youth organizers from FLA who are not puppets, but students that have come here tonight to stand up for what they believe in for their communities and their convictions. Um, I would like to support the equity map because it uh, most accurately allows for the proper representation of protected classes under the California Rights Act. Um, you know, it's critical that the voting map matches the demographics of our school district, which is currently the Latinx population community is 60% uh, of our school districts. Um, but many of the maps put forward do not show that representation. So there are three critical areas that must be addressed. I support the five seat district versus the seven seat district. The seven seat district dilutes the voting power of the communities of color who are the majority demographic in our school district. Uh, please keep the east and west side together as a, a as a voting block. Also Goleta, Isla Vista and Old Town Goleta must be kept together um, so that uh, dissimilar interests and there's no reason to divide them to dilute the representation. Uh, this map will affect what communities 
have um, representation and the board decision and politics for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Finnegan Wright. Hello, yes. Um, my name is Finnegan Wright. I'm a sophomore at Despotis High School. Um, I, I sort of want to comment and um, I guess express a revulsion at some of the comments that have been thrown at these students in the call tonight. I think it is um, ridiculous to suppose that um, we aren't able to like think our own thoughts and to express our own opinions. I think that um, myself and many of my peers have thought very deeply on a lot of these matters. And it's very rude when adults come in and say, oh, you guys uh, aren't critically thinking or you guys are being brainwashed because no, we're doing this of our own volition. These things are very important to us. It, this is a school board meeting. All these things affect our schools. So it's affecting us more than anyone else. So I guess I just want to express um, unhappiness with, with some of the comments that have been directed at us and also express support for the action that uh, FLA and CAUSE have been taking at um, raising uh, student voices and trying to push for a more equitable map to um, adequately represent the uh, uh, people in our district. Thank you. Thank you. And President Munoz, this uh, concludes public comment on this item. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Trujillo. At this time, uh, we will take a 10 minute break and it's 822, so we will be back at 842. Uh, thank you. Sorry, 832. Um, thank you so much. OK, um, we are back in session, and we'll continue with the public hearing on the uh, MAP trustee scenarios. OK, at this time, we will have a board member comments on the trustee maps and questions that you may have. Ms. Ford? Uh, well, I'm happy to share my thoughts, but also, Ms. Munoz, I wonder um, if uh, you have some sense for how we're going to make a decision tonight or what we are going to do tonight. Um, it would help me to sort of frame the whole conversation. Do you have a thought? Yes, um, certainly I thought that after discussion and an opportunity to ask questions that we may have, it would be helpful if the trustees um, if the <clears throat> board members chose two to three trustee maps that they prefer and they would let us know you know what they are so that we could reach a consensus in order to prepare for the next board meeting on uh, February 8th because at that time we will need to make a decision on which map we're going to choose okay would you like me to start yes certainly. okay uh, first of all, thanks for the report, Scott. Um, I do have some comments here that I'd like to just sort of refer to and read. Um, first of all, I really appreciate the effort to almost completely overload us with important information regarding voters, ethnic groups, schools, etc. And I really appreciate the involvement of so many community members. But in the end, I do believe that seven districts creates a more personal and focused approach to engaging and involving our community in important issues and decisions. Um, I see the powerful potential of deeper work and involvement of board members through the creation of subcommittees, for example. I also see the potential that a seven-person board would encourage greater involvement from community members in running for school board running for school board is really hard it's hard to get the word out to large groups of people across this huge uh, district with so many diverse diverse interests and of course we all know fundraising is really tough um, so i think running for the board and being on the board would be much more reasonable and equitable with seven and um, so my review of the maps leads me to believe that map six should be a finalist uh, as well as a com the equity map, and which has five members, and the equity seven person map, which is a combination of map four and the demands of equity map number five. Um, I think that they all represent and most clearly implement the California Voting Rights Act. Uh, equity 7 map, for example, does combine the east side and west side and results in a higher Latinx voting age population, like 48%, uh, I think, and 
That map also creates a Latino plurality district and a protected class majority district. So my votes are the equity map, map six, and equity seven as finalists. Mr. Kelly? Uh, I echo the same vote and um, explanation as Ms. Ford. Uh, I do think just the nature of a seven-person map allows for more accurate representation because you're representing less people, um, especially if we don't want wealthier people to have an advantage. It's better for their, when running for the school board, it's better for there to be a smaller, pe smaller amount of people represented in each district so money isn't the only determine, only thing determining how many people you're reaching, and that's um, made possible with less people being represented. And I think there are ways to make a seven-person map more equitable by combining the ideas from the five-person equi equity map that is presented by many community groups and combining that with the same principles of the seven-person map. So I echo Ms. Ford's opinions. Ms. Alvarez? Mr. Price? Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Would I, I like to ask some clarifying questions, please. Could you refresh my memory as far as the California Voting Rights Act, what it requires, and what are we absolutely required to do this evening? I'll take the last question. The agenda tonight uh, calls for you to narrow down the choices to uh, two or potentially three maps, as opposed to taking final action on anything. And I believe your uh, first question had to do with uh, what's required, what's covered by the CVRA, is that correct? What has driven this board, starting in 2018, when you adopted a resolution to move away from at-large voting to by trustee areas, was the California Voting Rights Act. And um, you're following that process now along or as part of 15 different districts in Santa Barbara County. Obviously, there have been hundreds around the state. The California Voting Rights Act is written in such a way that um, it is very, very easy to show that, um, that minority representation is under-influenced in local elections. And if that can be shown in any way, it is said to trigger a requirement to move away from at-large elections. That is the California Voting Rights Act. It's only about changing from at-large elections. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the question of how many trustees. The question of how many trustees is a separate question and it involves a separate procedure that um, requires actions additional to uh, creating trustee areas. And so the decision making about going to seven trustees as, a, as opposed to five is in my view unconnected to any legal requirements that you have. Rather, it's entirely a matter for the board's discretion. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I wanted to make sure I understand, understood that we would be compliant with the, uh, the spirit of the law, the California Voting Rights Act, by going to district elections and not necessarily by increasing the number of board members. That is absolutely the case. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. So having that clarification in my mind, I, I wanna make uh, two, two comments. One, it's, it, I have to say it really saddens me 
that this is already creating such a division. We, I was selected at large, and it was very hard. I'm going to tell you, extremely, extremely hard, especially being a first-time candidate. But at the end of the day, I'm, I represent equally the secondary district or the, and the elementary district. I care exactly the same for Dos Pueblos High School as I do for Cleveland Elementary School and every school in between. I'm also one of those students that were referenced to tonight about being bused and about everything else that was mentioned. And I, my job in this board is to represent those 13,000 students and to do the best that I can for every single one of them, regardless of their zip code. I, at this point, believe that the best thing for our district is to remain with five trustees and, of course, to comply with the law. I looked at the scenarios. I wish I could come up with the exact mathematical balance because that would make me that would make me very, very happy, but I, I wasn't able to find that in any of the maps that have been presented. Uh, the one that seems to have a better mathematical balance with a 4% variance, it's scenario number five. So I would vote that we consider scenario number five. My other point is I consider everything that we have on our to-do list right now. We have asked from staff to do efforts that have never been asked before, starting with the superintendent, with the cabinet, with the principals, the admin assistants, the custodians, and everyone else. COVID has taken over our daily operations. And at the same time, we have to keep focus on what we are here as to the why. And the why is every single student, every chance, every day. And I do not believe this is the time for us to, for us to make such a radical change that is going to add extreme work to the already extremely thin staff members. Those are my, my two points tonight. Thank you. Um, I just need a minute. Um, there was one public speaker who said she had her hand raised and was not able to speak. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, disregard that, I guess. Um, yeah, the hearing is closed right now, so we will not have more public comment. Ms. sims Moulton. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, I don't even have the words tonight. I have, my, I'm just as wordless tonight as I was when we took the resolution because the very f f thought that I think was happening now, tonight, is already dividing. It's already dividing. I mean, it's human nature to say if we're going to be here, here, and here, there's going to be camps of this and camps of that. And so it, it breaks away from the very thing that we're trying to do is stay united, making sure that we represent each and every student. Uh, and so I just, to even think about going to district elections and not be at large, it concerns me greatly. Some of the good discussion tonight, but I want to appreciate the discussion tonight. Um, uh, but on all who have been uh, involved in this. Um, but, but as I looked at the scenarios, as I thought, I, I wrote several notes because my thoughts have just kind of been all over the place to say, is this the best representation that we can do for our students? I know the law says we should, but I also think that it's important to address the very issues that create the underrepresentation in the first place. I think that's really crucial. Um, and it's not just about making dividing because people, there's, there's opportunities to move and go in diff different, 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 different districts and you may not get the necessary um, representative voice that we're thinking if people are allowed to go and move in the various districts to run. That's not an accusation, it's just an observation. 
Um, so, and I also think that um, this creates a lot, as, as Ms. Uh, Alvarez has stated, it keeps a lot of work on an already strained administration trying to figure this out. Um, so I'm more inclined to stay at the five, um, you know, areas. Uh, I would rather stay at large and address the issues that keep the underrepresentation uh, in the beginning. Because I think we can address those in terms of some of the things, for instance, has to do with the cost to run that has been mentioned. It's a lot to run and the, fan, the, you know, the financial backing to, to keep that. If you're under known, not known, you know, that makes it harder. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get the representation if we don't address the issues that got us here in the first place, right? So I think that's another piece as we start to run with that. So how do we address that issue in terms of costs? Is, is, should there be a cost? Where do we address that issue? Um, and secondly, I think it's important in terms of um, being a school board member, the importance of it to really understand it. I would like to see um, free but mandated training for all people who are running for the school board so you fully understand what it takes to run this, to understand the ed codes and all the different things that sometimes when we're, we're as we're working our way through, um, that our words get misconstrued and what we can and cannot do and therefore it creates another chaos and confusion. So I, I would like to even see that looking at a state board of, uh, education level that how do we create free, mandated, so that the people who feel they can represent, you've got the training, you got the resources and you have the full understanding of what it takes to be on a school board. And I don't feel that seven districts is gonna, gonna gain us any more representation if we don't address those issues as well. So I, as I said, I, I won't, I won't um, belabor the point um, that it, it just disturbs me that the work that we're doing to try to be united uh, making sure that we're representing all of our students, no matter where they come from, and to make them feel that way. Because inevitably, we'll talk about District 6 or District 5 or District 7. We're not going to talk about a unified district that we have right now. That's already been, you know, tonight, that's already been part of the conversation. And I appreciate that. But I'm just saying that in the end, is this the best way to represent the needs of our students? Is this the best way to meet their needs? And is it the best way to prepare them for this world? But right now, what's going to happen is, on top of all the things that we're already doing, we're going to create more chaos and confusion that takes us away from the focus of what we need to do. And we still are dealing with the, the impacts of COVID, of how do we do it. We were just talking about the report today, the amount of work it's, it's going to take. So I don't want to sound preachy, but I just think it's important for us to look at some of the barriers that creates the, the inability to access, to run, and to create diversity. And if we look at those things, then we can really say, because I would, again, my preference would to stay at large. But if we can't, I would still like to address those issues. I don't know if they can be resolved here, but at least like to have them in the mix as we go forward to continue to make sure that when you're coming and running for the district, it hasn't been, you haven't been able to run because you're not able to afford it or you're a lesser known candidate or the fact that you're not as resourced or understanding um, the training that really is, reside, you know, that requires to be the best representative on this board. I've learned a lot of things, I'll be very honest. I've learned a lot of things by fire up here and that's not the best way. So I, that's why I'm also hoping that we can, again, anyone coming up for a candidate um, for a school board, um, have that mandated training free. I just want to keep <laughs> doing that because, I, again, I don't want to talk, talk about costs and then add another cost. So thank you for that. Um, I, I support uh, the five um, areas, and I think it is map five that I'm looking at. That is what I circled here, is what I'm, I'm prepared to support if we need to make that decision tonight. I think, no, it, no I'm sorry. It's the five district. Scenario it's scenario five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, I will go next, I, um, unless Miss Caps, unless you'd like to go ahead. Go ahead, President Munoz. I'll speak after you. Okay, um, certainly I have 
concerns about the the trustee, you know, the trustee districts. Um, I think that I applaud, well, I know that I applaud the participation of our youth in terms of looking at the districts, you know, looking at who will represent them. After all, you know, this is about their education. Um, I think that seven trustees, in terms of the way that, that I've seen the map, is actually going to be less of a diverse uh, representation for our students and representing our families. <clears throat> the reason why I looked at um, the unity map is because it doesn't break up Isla Vista the way that I saw that the majority of the other maps do. Um, it keeps Isla Vista together and it keeps Old Town Goleta with Isla Vista and also the other, the uh, east side and the west side, in terms of having them represented, is also good for me. Um, and my, you know, question also is that if it did come down to making a decision, um, could we look at the equity map? Could we look at a variation of it? Um, and do we have to do this, you know, to prevent from being sued, um, basically? you know, in terms of the um, California uh, voting rights. Um, yes. Yes. Yes, one, one of the things is I'm being told is that if we have five trustees for school district representation, you know, that we would be at risk for being sued um, and not abiding by it. And I feel like, you know, like five trustees um, with a school board, you know, members that could afford to run, I think would be a better option. And I'm more, con I'm concerned about like the neighborhoods that we would be looking at. Um, and as Ms. Sims Milton said, you know, I also ran at large and I've, I prefer that model, but I'd like to know what you would, you know, advise. In my opinion, there is no basis whatsoever for a lawsuit arising from a failure to move to seven trustees. And that would include both the California Voting Rights Act and the Federal Voting Rights Act. So as you all know, it doesn't take very much to file a lawsuit, but that lawsuit would be unsuccessful. Okay, that's very helpful to me because I feel like what we're talking about is unifying our community, representing our students, and having the trustees who would be able to help make decisions up here, you know, um, budget-wise, curriculum-wise, and helping um, make sure that we're a successful district and that we're able to bring up the achievement gap, you know, for our students so that our students do better. Ms. Ford? Could I just clarify something, uh, Mr. Price? I was under the impression that we don't have the option to stay with at large. Is that correct? I could have um, uh, not heard all of uh, uh, Ms. Munoz's question. To the extent that you were asking whether or not the board had an option to remain at large. Was that part of your question? That was part of the question, um, but I also, you know, um, I want to know if we could s stay with five trustees, right? With five trustees, if we did decide on one of these maps, could we stay with five trustees and avoid, you know, getting into legal problems? Right, and I believe I answered that latter question but um, uh, Ms. Ford is correct. I didn't answer the other part of the question, so forgive me. Um, in the event that the board was to elect to stay with at-large voting, uh, there's a substantial likelihood that there would be a claim asserted that you're thereby violating the California Voting Rights Act because of the tests that are used in interpreting that act 
for what constitutes a violation. And no matter how diverse your board may be, no matter how successful it may be, there is in fact a probability that there would be a lawsuit filed. And without you know, getting into a long-winded thing, before a lawsuit can be filed in those circumstances, there's a requirement that a claim be asserted. If there is a claim asserted, then there is what's called a safe harbor provision for a school district, which means that if they promptly act after a claim is filed and within a very short period of time, like 90 days, take the steps to move towards and implement um, district area elections, then the maximum monetary exposure they have is $30,000 for attorney fees and expenses. So there's a way in which that kind of an action could be taken by the board or not action, no action in effect, that would minimize the risk. But I think that based upon the strong feelings that um, the district does need to be uh, broken into trustee areas, not to mention the number of attorneys statewide who are looking for low-hanging fruit, that a district this size would be um, very vulnerable to a claim. And unless promptly resolved, um, than a lawsuit. Thank hey, you. I add a comment. Oh, go ahead. I just add a comment to, to, the, to that. So thank you for, um, for clarifying that. But I just want to make clear my comments. While I prefer at large, but I certainly don't want to put us at risk of being the low hanging fruit. So I just want to be clear on that. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Price. I appreciate it. And my choice would be scenario, uh, scenario A. I'm sorry. Uh, for the maps. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Caps. Thank you. Well, Mr. Price, uh, I want to just ask you to clarify uh, what was indicated in your memo about the logistical challenges of a choice to go to seven um, and the potential problems that would pose with uh, getting getting the work done in time for the election in November. Can you just summarize that briefly for the public, please? Yes, on account of the fact that any move to expand the number of trustees involves a different procedural step, the further action that would be required is going to take more time. Specifically, after the Santa Barbara County Committee on School District Organization would presumably approve a resolution by your board deciding on um, how you were going to move into uh, trustee areas. Uh, and they approved that. If at the same time the board was to adopt a resolution that it wanted to move to seven trustees, then the action by the county committee to approve that expansion would not be the last step. Because under the Education Code, once the County Committee on School District Organization approves a request to go to expand the number of trustees, there is an automatic call for an election throughout the district for the voters to decide whether or not the decision on the part of the elected board is supported by the voters. However, the State Board of Education will consider and most likely will approve a waiver of any election requirement. So what that means in sum is that after the county committee action on um, moving to district elections and under the hypothetical question you're asking to also expand to seven trustees, there would then need to be action taken by the State Board of Education to waive the district election. In order to do that, there are certain things that the board will need to do, meaning specifically, should you decide to go in that direction, a resolution 
requesting the State Board to seek a waiver. Um, there are other um, things that staff would need to work on. But the bottom line in all that is that on account of the fact that this was under active consideration, staff and my office reached out last week. We had discussions with the State Board of Education who considered another um, expansion from five to seven trustees in another school district last week. And we wanted to find out what the attitude was of staff and the State Board. They granted the waiver. And we also dealt with the time requirements. And so, again, the bottom line is it's doable. If it's going to timely be done, should that be the um, wish of the board, then action should be taken at your uh, scheduled meeting on February 8. And staff in my office would work on getting a waiver request in prior to February 22. And then it would go on the State Board of Education uh, to approve a waiver request at their meeting on uh, May 22nd and 23, I believe. And all that has also been discussed with the County Elections Office, and they are um, satisfied that although it goes beyond their preferred timeline, that it's allowable and everything could be put in place in time for the November election. Thank you for answering that. So I, um, the whole the whole point of all this is equity. So I want to thank those uh, community members who have speak and spoke, spoken to that point today. And that's what we're looking at. I think I also want to um, thank my colleagues, uh, Ms. Sims Moten and Ms. Alvarez in particular for speaking out to the fact that um, as much as we understand the need to transition this way, it does come with some adjustment because in my entire five years plus on this board, never once have I thought to myself, oh, that so-and-so board member really just cares about that school or that area or that, uh, or elementary or second. I mean, it's, we really take the responsibility of representing every student, all staff members, all schools to heart. And I've never even, it's never even occurred to me. So I, I so, but I guess the point is, so I want to acknowledge that and, and um, express gratitude for the very genuine spirit of my colleagues, um, not just those before us, but those who came before us uh, for that. And I, I'm that spirit, I know, I want to make sure continues because this is really about the, the future and the future elections and the future board and to it to provide some protections so that the the uh, diversity that we have currently can continue and the representation that we have, in my opinion, currently can continue. And so with that in mind, I certainly support scenario number A, uh, some scenario A, uh, because of the um, effort to keep certain neighborhoods together. Um, I, I appreciate uh, this uh, map number five as well. Um, although what was been pointed out today about Old Town and Isla Vista raises some, some concerns to me of those not being together. So I have some more concerns about that. But again, this whole endeavor is about equity and ensuring future equity on this board. I have questions about moving to seven, um, the procedures that Mr. Price has outlined, but also uh, what Ms. Sims Moten spoke to is it, is, it is hard to be a working person running for the school board. Um, it is hard to be a working person on the school board. And the, the cost of running, even just getting on the ballot, uh, the cost of you know, the, the time that it takes um, away from, from one's work. Uh, historically, these have been jobs that people do in retirement. And I know we've moved away from that and that's wonderful, but I just do wanna pose that we, we, we are trying to ensure 
equity for the future, but we need to be also looking at other measures that would that would make access to this service more ready, more readily available to more people. And that's the commitment. And uh, so that I look forward to the next discussion and appreciate the community's involvement thus far. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Ms. Caps. At this time, um, we would like to look at, you know, being prepared to make a motion to select a final scenario for adoption at our next meeting. Um, do I have a motion? Right, to select. Yes, there's two um, that are common so far. It's scenario A and scenario five that are the ones that were mo most selected by board members. I have a question about process. I, I'm not sure you can take a vote on something that wasn't on the action, wasn't an action agenda item. I could, I could see taking an informal poll, which perhaps you have in front of you, which is, is fine. But for me, I would worry about taking an action that's an official board action without it being on the agenda. Can you advise Mr. Price, can you advise yeah. on the recommendations that we're taking before the next meeting? I believe Scott, if you're on the line as well, you asked that we create the short list and be prepared to make a motion to select the final scenario for adoption at the next meeting. I don't think it matters which way you do it, but based on the Brown Act issue that um, um, Trustee Ford is raising, the agenda says selection of three final maps for consideration. So to me, selection means that a decision is made among multiple choices. And obviously, it also indicates the number three. Um, which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to pick three maps. So I think it's the option of the board to go whichever way you want to deal with it. Obviously, you could not take final action, and you'd be absolutely correct in that regard. Right. So then, yeah, so then um, we don't need to take um, action tonight. We, don't, we won't be making a motion because it's not an action item. Um, but it's my understanding that we've looked at like we've selected two or three so far miss sims mountain can you just clarify what what three that we decided because we've kind of been were you keeping cap <laughs> to, oh so in listening to all of you i believe i captured everybody's uh selections and i noted that there were two uh, commonalities between all five of you which was scenario a and scenario five Okay. are the ones that I heard that everybody mentioned as, as the two most common that were preferred. And I noted that uh, Board Member Ford said Scenario A, but considering it around seven areas. Am I correct in stating that back to you the way you stated it? Six. In your selection, you said Scenario A and Scenario 5, and then you mentioned Scenario... I don't know what equity seven, we didn't have equity seven on the agenda. So my understanding is that that item was close. Oh, sorry, you're not using your mic. Yep. Uh, what do you mean the item's closed? So for submission of maps, Mr. Vance, could you speak to that? Um, the timeline for submission? Oh, Scott, are you on the line? If you could speak to the, the deadline for submission of maps. Sure. So um, we extended the submission timeline. Originally, I believe it was the 12th. And we extended that timeline to the 18th of January. And um, that was articulated at the January 13th community meeting as well. And so when preparing the board packet for this meeting um, and meeting the submission deadline, um, the maps that you see in front of you were what was uh, presented during that time timeline. 
So if I may, I just would like to remind at the beginning, you asked a question about how we would we arrive at the selection of two to three maps, and you, you mentioned to the board you'd like to arrive at as a consensus. Uh, and so I just want to remind that back to you guys as board members and, and go ahead and ask, have you deliberated of how you want to move forward? But I just wanted to remind, that's why I was taking note of the commonalities of what everybody was saying. It's so back to you, board president. Yeah, so I guess we can discuss, you know, coming to a consensus for choosing um, two or three scenarios of the maps that were presented to us. Um, Are you asking for further discussion now on this? Okay. So again, I, I don't, I don't think I quite heard because I, I heard uh, Equity Seven bit and know that it, that's even something viable in this, but I, I don't know. Is it? It's not. Okay. So. But, so anyway, so my consensus, I still, I, I would go with scenario five is my first um, um, choice. I, I think that scenario A can be looked at. It'd be interesting to overlay, you know, five over that to, you know, keeping the neighborhoods together. But my first is five, because I think that's the one that kind of really gave a little bit more um, evenness in terms of schools in the recent place. And that was the one we were kind of looking at. So. So scenario five would be my first and then um, A, and if it came down to us re-looking at it, I could see maybe doing some combination of those two. But those are my two. Um, certainly, Ms. Alvarez. My first uh, choice would be scenario five because it's the most mathematically balanced. I am interested in exploring scenario A. I do have several questions about that. I don't know if tonight's the night or not the next meeting to ask, but I would um, lean for those two to be further considered. Ms. Ford? Uh, I would still um, raise my hand for scenario six and scenario A, the equity map. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly? Uh, I would say if I had to choose my first choice would be scenario six, just because I'm in favor of a seven trustee map. And then if I had to choose one for five trustees, it'd be scenario five. But I'm also open to looking into um, scenario A, the equity map. I think I still have a lot more questions about the logistics of all of these maps. So um, I'm just wondering, would it hurt us to have a seven trustee map in our consideration for the next meeting, just because I know a lot of the public also expressed their interest in a seven trustee map. Um, so I'm just wondering how, how much would it delay us from progressing if we were to consider this, just because I know a lot of people are in favor of it. I, I could just say, just in terms of, this is I was kind of separating what we have here. So I think on our presentation, it said two to three. Um, in terms of that. So um, we certainly could look at that as a consideration because yeah. we do have the option of doing two to three. So, And then, of course, we don't vote on what we finally want. Yeah, so with that being said, I would be willing to put forward um, scenario five, equity map, scenario A, and um, scenario six because that provides, I think, the widest range of possibilities for all people and all opinions that were stated tonight through public comment and by my fellow board members. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, Ms. Caps? I think we have consensus. I'm, uh, mine would be scenario A and scenario five, but certainly willing to continue to talk about seven members with uh, scenario six. But my, my top is scenario A. Okay, and um, my choice would be scenario A. Yes. So again, board members consensus means you can live with the decisions. It sounds like you have two that are everybody's agreeing on, which is A and five, but then there's a third option, six. And again, you can make the recommendation today that you will take those three to the next meeting uh, on February 8th, which at which time you'll make a final vote. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Maldonado. That's 
one more question. So as we're considering this, and I'm in consensus for that. So, um, so how are any questions, as as, as uh, Dawson has just said, how will we get questions answered about this to bring to be better informed for the discussion, our final discussion? Can we? Where do we make that discussion, or will it be at the meeting? Questions that could further de determine we want, you know, six, five, or or eight. So where would that pro where would that process come in? Just to be clear, are you inquiring about uh, questions that you may have during the interim, or yeah. am I missing the question? Yeah, no, uh, it's right, but I'll, I'll restate it because I was a little confused as I was saying it. So I'm just trying to see <laughs> that we've, con we've made a consensus here that these are the three we, we want to still consider. But if there's questions in between the time of our next meeting, where does that discussion happen? Well, one suggestion that I could make is that if individual board members have questions, then they can be individually sent to um, the superintendent's office or Mr. Venz's office without copying the other board members. Right. And then those questions can be attempted to be answered um, by staff and with any legal input that may be appropriate. Okay. And then brought back um, you know, in the form of a memo that would precede the next meeting on February 8th. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, so we'll go on to the consent agenda now. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, that concludes this item. <laughs> The consent agenda are items that are considered routine and are not likely to require any discussion. Dr. Maldonado and her staff have recommended that the board approves all the consent agenda items. The board has also had an opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before tonight. Um, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comments on the consent agenda items? No public comment. Okay, um, board members, may I have a motion to, oh, I'm sorry, um, are there any items that require more information or, or that you would request to be polled? I just have a, a correction. Um, on the paper agenda, as I was saying, the minutes for January 11, 2021, it's January 11, 2022. And then sometimes even if on here, it's on there. So I just want to make sure if someone's reading that, we're really approving yeah. those minutes. Thank you for that. Ms. Trujillo, can we confirm the agenda that I'm looking at online on Board Docs says uh, January 11, 2022 board minutes, but we have a question about it on the printed agenda that is both posted for uh, in our building and for the board members. Mm -hmm. Could you confirm that that is 2022 in the posted agenda? Well, we know that we have 2021 in our hands in <laughs> yeah. front of us. That's what somebody will ask. Um, Superintendent Maldonado, this is an error, and it's both printed on the printed agenda as well, so we need to correct that. Thank you. I know that the online copy is 2022, correct? No, it also says 2021. Ah, okay. okay. We will make that correction. Thank you for that. Okay. With, okay. with that, I move approval of the consent agenda with the correction noted. A second. Okay. Thank you. Um, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The consent agenda passes unanimously. Okay, now we're going to go to the public hearing, um, second reading, sunshining of the Santa Barbara Unified School District proposal to reopen contract negotiations with the Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Thank you, Board President Munoz, Board members, good evening, Superintendent Maldonado. Um, we are opening this public hearing tonight um, as a requirement to sunshine the um, 
proposal letter that was attached in your documents. This is outlining um, the district's intention to negotiate Articles um, 14 and Articles 6 of the contract. And this public hearing is an opportunity for the public to comment on this particular proposal. Um, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? No public comment on this item. Okay. Thank you. Um, board members, do you have any concerns or questions about it? Oh. Um, this concludes the public hearing on this item. That's okay. <laughs> we'll mix it up. <laughs> uh, second, okay. Item three: Second reading, sunshine of the Santa Barbara Teachers Association proposal to reopen contract negotiations with SB Unified School District. Dr. Becchio. Thank you very much. And this public hearing is to introduce to the public, for a second time, the proposal that Santa Barbara Teachers Association is putting forward for their intention to negotiate. Articles 6, Articles 8, and Articles 10 of the contract. And this is an opportunity for the public to make public comment on this item. Uh, Mr. Trujillo, is there any public comment on this item? No public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, board members, are there any questions on this item? No? Okay. Seeing Good. none, that concludes the public hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. The next item is on the action agenda, the approval of the naming of Dos Pueblos Engineering Academy Foundation uh, buildings. Hey, Ms. Hernandez. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, board members. Um, before we get started, I just want to introduce this wonderful gentleman that's in the room that you have all sort of said hello to, um, Dave Hetyonk. We've brought him back for uh, an interim short period of time to help us with, um, as the director of facilities and modernization. Dave has been was with Santa Barbara Unified for 18 years. He gladly retired, and we brought him back. <laughs> and anyway, I want to make sure that everybody um, says hello to David. Do you want to say anything at all to the board? Well, thank you for thinking of me and for asking me back for a period of time. I am more than happy to help out and uh, very pleased to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now for the uh, next item, I would like to um, introduce Mr. Bill Woodard um, to go ahead and, and introduce uh, your, your team here. Yes, good evening, members of the board and everyone on this meeting tonight. Um, my name is Bill Woodard, principal of Dos Pueblos High School, here to talk about a really exciting project that I think is going to be uh, super cool for generations of students to come, and that is the CT Pavilion project. We're here to introduce the team tonight, uh, share some progress, and talk about the naming of the building. So I'm going to just, without further ado, turn it over to Daniel Husting, who is the Engineering Academy Foundation president. He's also one of my former English students when he was a student at DP, so proud papa here. Introducing Daniel. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Um, I just want to share quickly that the Engineering Academy Foundation is really excited to continue our history of supporting engineering education in this community with this project. Um, I wish the Engineering Academy Foundation could claim credit for this incredible idea that uh, is going to be shared in detail with you. but. But really, it's Amir and Emily uh, Shair who came to the foundation and asked if we thought we could continue to support a broader vision uh, on the Dos Pueblos campus. Uh, and I'll let them explain how we got to where we are today. Amir. 
thank you all for having us today. Um, want to welcome Dave Hetyunk back. I remember going to Dave in 2008 when we were going to build the building I'm sitting in right now, and he was like super supportive along with Brian Sarvis. So Dave, it's great to have you back. Looking forward to, to working with you over the next you know few months as we continue on this project. So just a little bit of background on the, on the project. Um, the idea was that there was $5 million of local bond money that had been allocated to Dos Pueblos for modernization. And one of the opportunities was to deal with the portables. We've had portables here since 19, I don't know, 70. And so um, after, after some consideration and looking at all this, you know, and the project site, we were able to, to look at that and realize like there's got to be something else we can do other than replacing portables with portables. Um, and that was the plan. Ultimately, the money, there wasn't enough money. And it was just like the best we can do is, is take these old portals back out and on the same exact site, bring in new, more modern and modular buildings, but still uh, portable non-permanent structures. So next slide. You can see there the, the highlighted area in green is the site and that's where all of that is taking place it's the south side of campus you can go to the next slide so the idea of replacing the portables with new portables um was not super exciting to us and amir and i talked about it and we were like oh i we could do better couldn't we do better what can we try and we really just asked the question what if like what if we tried something else? What if we use that 5 million and tried to build on it? And so we proposed the following ideas. We proposed the idea of upgrading the project plan from standard portable classrooms to perhaps a modern state-of-the-art career technical education facility, or perhaps facilities incorporating multiple career technical education programs. That was our idea. Maybe we could do more and dream bigger. We proposed the idea of leveraging the $5 million of the local bond money that had already been budgeted for the portables for this purpose. We, we proposed applying for competitive state grants earmarked for specialized facilities for career technical education, specifically for manufacturing and product development that would be part of the DPEA program and also arts, media and entertainment. And John Dent, the program director for media is gonna be speaking a little bit tonight as well. We also proposed, of course, we were gonna to have to raise more money. So we proposed establishing a capital campaign to raise the funds for from our local community. Next slide. I love that just the next slide is like, and we had immediate success. <laughs> that it did take a lot of work and a lot of time, but we are excited to report that it was successful. And the school district was able to reallocate the original 5 million of the bond money that had been budgeted for the portable classrooms to the pavilion project. And it was actually leveraged so that we were able to secure an additional 10 million ex in external funding for the project. And that an external funding came from grants, foundations, and generous community philanthropists. And the groundbreaking of the $15 million CTE pavilion took place in fall 2020. And we have a fun photo from that to show you. The next slide. There's our group standing out there in the dirt. That was really exciting in 2020 to stand out there. And that's right in front of our current facility for the Engineering Academy that we opened in 2012. And so it's all very festive. We're out there with our shovels. We didn't actually do the digging. We, we posed. Next slide. So here, here you can see um, a, a close up of that that south side of campus and the uh, newer portables that were relocated. Some of those are newer portables that were really relocated elsewhere on campus, but the remaining portables are being replaced by um, this CTE pavilion. And um, Amir, next slide. I think. Mute, Amir. I got it. The, the, your muted thing it's like the zoom festival of that so um 
when we, this is a, a shot of the facility from a construction camera. And one of the things that was exciting about this is that when we built this first building that I'm sitting in, we were just, we were so overloaded. We didn't even really hadn't had an experience like this and we really missed out on documenting it. And so right away, when we knew this was going to happen, I reached out to Steve Vizzolini and said, Hey, if we pay for some cameras, will you guys, you know, take some district resources and get them up? And he was super um, supportive of that. We got the cameras and he got them up right away. So the shot you see right here is from one of those construction cameras. There are three set up. And if you go actually to YouTube on any weekday, you can just type in CT Pavilion into YouTube and you can watch. And again, I have shared this with some of the board members and I know uh, Ms. Ford uh, had expressed that she's super interested in construction and really has been enjoying it and emailed me a couple of times, you know, when things are pretty exciting that are happening. So that's been fun. So you can see the build site pretty effectively when you look at, at that slide. So go ahead to the next slide. So this was right after that in the fall of 2020, still again, same construction camera. This is what it looked like when the site was cleared. And so this specific site that we're, what we're working on is about one and a half acres for this new site that's being developed. So it's a, it's a big plot of land and it's really been an eyesore and we're really, really again, excited to have it, have it be changing and have it be moving forward into something that's, that's really gonna be an improvement for the campus. Next slide. And so this is, I think for me, I, I don't know if you guys have any perspective where I am in the conference room of our building and right out that door is where that building is. And so it's just so exciting for us here as we watch this come up out of the ground. And it was so slow. They were pushing dirt around for six, seven, eight months. And finally it started to come up out of the ground in, in the summer. And so where you see right now is the status about a week ago from one of the construction cameras and the facilities have really all kind of, uh, you know, are coming together. And so the, I'm going to talk specifically on the facility that's on the left in that slide. So that slide right there, we're again, we're at 1.5 years of progress and about six months to go. And in terms of the space that's more affiliated with the DPEA, in that front section, there's going to be a professional gallery space. I think some of you know that we develop now professional STEAM exhibits in the Dose Public Engineering Academy with our students. And the idea is to have a professional gallery space that is public facing. Uh, there will also be an exhibit development area. The roof deck, which we've been up on top of, and you'll, you'll get a little glimpse of that, is occupiable. So we're going to do outdoor exhibits, and we're also going to be doing some star parties. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then there's also offices and meeting spaces on the roof as well, and that's going to support residencies and collaboration with local industry, et cetera. Okay. Next slide. John Dent is going to come and talk to you now about the media side of the facility. Yeah, so thanks, Mayor. We're very excited. This uh, front building will be housing the media program. And the media program at DP is open to students in all grades. And in this new building, it will allow more than 500 students per year to be a part of a hands-on learning experience in there. In that building, um, we really have a lot of wonderful things going on. And Media influences our culture and shapes our society, and our students are both consumers and makers of media. In this new building, we'll facilitate a unique and innovative way of learning and teaching. The design is an open concept where teams of students and staff flow throughout and collaborate in a way that isn't possible in the typical classroom. There's eight spaces in this new building. The four central rooms will have glass walls, providing open, unique space that can be opened up to facilitate collaboration and student interaction. There will be a design lab where students create advanced digital art, design and graphics. And adjacent to this lab is a maker space that will allow students to bring their projects into the physical world. Paired with those two rooms is a super classroom that will blend publication media, both print and online and photography, allowing students to work together to create various forms of media. At one end of the super classrooms of photography and sound studio, and a control room that will serve as a hub for the campus, managing cameras in the gym, the field, the Greek theater, the EPAC, and even the new DPEA building, allowing students to learn valuable live streaming skills and share a campus with the world. And then on the south end of the building, there's an amazing new television studio equipped with seven editing bays for teams to grow and create top-notch video productions. This studio will host our new school news program, DP News, other video classes and provide opportunities for community productions. I'm here. 
So next slide. So one of the things I want to say, and we're super excited about John Dent and the team of teachers he's working with to have the same opportunities we have for collaboration. This building that I'm in right now has been transformative for that. And just hearing John's enthusiasm for all the spaces, I mean, you can see he's, he's salivating at the opportunity to be able to get in there and do all that stuff with his team. So that's, that's going to be great. So this next slide um, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see our team of teachers and we're actually sitting on the structural ring, steel ring, the structural steel ring that's going to support the astronomical observatory that is going to be on the roof. And so that observatory, there's an example of the observatory that we're going to have the dome on the right-hand side of this image. And so this is going to be part of a node and a network of educational telescopes that are spread throughout the U.S. and beyond. And it's supported by a local nonprofit uh, for, founded by a former Google executive uh, and it's Las Cumbres Observatory and they're based in Goleta. So we're just super excited to be able to have this idea of having astronomy, star parties, all of that taking place on the occupiable roof deck and inviting the community to be a part of that. Um, so next slide. So this is kind of fun. It's an aerial shot that was just like zoomed out. You can see on the roof deck, our team is still there in the ring for the observatory. But this really shows the scale and scope of this project and truly the makeover of the south side of campus that started with our efforts in 2008. Um, this whole side of campus was old parking lots and those original those original portables. And so starting in 2008, we had that idea to fundraise for our current facility that we're sitting in right now. And that's toward the back of this photo. You can see the football field at the end and that little cafeteria road and then the two new facilities and then the dirt area in the front is where the new parking lot is going to be. And that's actually two and a half acres of a makeover for DP campus that's going to be all dedicated to career technical education. And we're all really excited about it. Next slide. And as ex expanding what Emily and John said, that about half of the Dos Pueblos student population is going to be benefiting from these facilities on a daily basis. And that's that's obviously a tremendous success to be able to impact that uh, much of our of our student body. Um, and just looking at that site, it's just I remember where our old building was. I used to practice drums in that parking lot where the old building was when I was a student here. And just so, you know, just seeing that 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 side of campus was a beat up parking lot and a bunch of portables and for us to be able to be involved in this and work together and collaborate with, with John and with Bill and with all of these local philanthropists to do this has been wonderful. So now speaking of the philanthropists, we've had several folks that have been involved, but Virgil Ealings is who I'd like to be honoring today in terms of his support. He was the lead donor on this project. And um, for those of you who don't know Virgil Ealings, he's a local businessman, inventor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He's contributed millions of dollars to Santa Barbara community and beyond. He's given over $7 million to SBUSD projects and programs. And for this particular project, he's provided $4 million in support to help bring this whole vision to fruition. Um, I've gotten to know Virgil over the past um, about 12 years now. And I, I can't express how appreciative I am of him and his efforts and his support for just young people in our community. I mean, he just gave another million dollars to Girls and Boys Club of Santa Barbara County just, just in, in January, I just read that in the paper. And he's just so focused on helping young people and providing young people with opportunities. Um, he believes on, he, he, he and I talk about this, we, we share educational philosophies and there's ways to characterize it. He doesn't like using hands-on learning because he thinks people just feel like that's, you know, that your mind isn't engaged. And so he likes to call it brains-on learning where you're working on real uh, meaningful work. Um, and that's one of the things that drew him to be supporting DPEA and also is, has him excited about supporting the media program as well. And so I just personally, I think for Emily and John and for the school and the whole community that this is going to impact, um, I just want to say to Virgil, I, I want to be able to share this video with him that what he's done has meant the world to Emily and me. And um, he has enabled us to be creative and to continue in our entrepreneurial endeavors as educators and empowered us in ways that I could have never imagined when I first became a teacher 21 years ago. And so I just wanna, wanna specifically just thank Virgil, thank everything he's done for the community and just appreciate how much he's, he's helped the Santa Barbara community, Santa Barbara School District. So with that, I will turn it over to, to Daniel. 
I think following on there, uh, the Dos Povos Engineering Academy Foundation is really excited to be able to have this opportunity to honor Virgil Ealing's uh, and his contribution to this project and the Dos Povos campus um, and present you the board with the, with the proposed names that we've worked on in collaboration with Virgil. Uh, so John, I think you, you're gonna announce the name for the media facility. Next slide. Yeah, the media team is very excited to name our new building, the Virgil Ealings Media Arts and Communications Center. Virgil Ealings has always been an innovator and forward thinker, and this new facility will exemplify those traits. His continued support for brains on learning and project-based classrooms will allow students to experience opportunities that will rival some of the best colleges and professional studios in the country. Students in this program will be trained in communication skills that will benefit them in all aspects of their lives, and students will be able to explore their creativity throughout the program. Thank you to Virgil for recognizing the immense importance of media in our society and for helping our students to develop their skills, be creative, and explore careers in the media and communications world. Next slide. And it is my pleasure to announce that the new DPEA facility is going to be named the Virgil Ealing's Center for Creative Learning. And we're really excited about this because we worked closely with Virgil on the name of this facility. He gave a lot of thought and time and energy to it. And as we've been talking about, he really does like this idea of brains on learning and active engagement, learning by doing. He really likes the word learning more than he likes the word teaching because the learning is the active part that the students are doing. And of course, teachers and mentors can be learning right alongside students, which is really foundational to all of career technical education and the philosophy of doing authentic work. And so Virgil carefully selected that word creative for creative learning that he felt strongly spoke to a spoke to learning in a way that goes beyond the idea of just project based or hands on. And so the Virgil Ealing Center for Creative Learning will be a place where all community members and students can come and learn by doing. And we're so grateful to Virgil for his longstanding support of career technical education in the community. And his generosity, his generosity will continue to impact young people in our community for years to come. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you, Virgil. And that concludes our presentation and we welcome any questions. Yeah, just, and again, thank the board for your time and we, Emily and I watch most of the board meetings and we know how late these things can go and we appreciate having the time to honor Virgil in this board meeting. So thank you very much. And we will again take questions. Thank you everybody uh, for your presentation and for hanging in there with us board members. As you know, this is an action item that is uh, asking for your approval of the name and for your consideration and approval of the naming. Hello, uh, Ms. Trujillo, is there any public comment on this item? No public comment on this item. No, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, board members, uh, do you have, let's see, any questions or comments on this item? <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. I just want to call out a couple of things. Uh, first, I, f I feel compelled to call out the passion, the energy, the innovation, and the innumerable hours of hard work of the whole Dos Pueblos team, especially Emily, Amir, and John. Their enthusiasm and their brilliance is palpable. And also, just want to share my deep appreciation for the generosity of Mr. Ealings, um, truly impacting the future beyond our wildest dreams. We will never know, but we will be certain that it, the future of so many of our students and staff will never be the same. And yes, I can become quite obsessed with the CTE Pavilion uh, channel on YouTube. If you ever have just a couple moments, you can just watch it and watch, these, uh, watch this building go up and these construction workers do their jobs. 
Thanks. Ms. Alvarez? Well, first of all, a deep, deep appreciation to Mr. Shair and Emily and John, Mr. Woodard, everyone who is involved behind the scenes to make this happen. I mean, this is absolutely amazing, incredible. I, I, I've been there. I, I like Miss Ford. I <laughs> see it on YouTube, and it's just amazing. It reminds me of Dr. Seuss when he says, "Oh, the places you'll go," and this is the the opportunities before the students it's incredible it's amazing and thank you to dr illings for his passion for his belief that public education could be innovative public education could be engaging and public education is the foundation the great equalizer for opportunities for so many students out there so thank you from the bottom of our heart your legacy will be thousands and thousands of students who will benefit from this engineer scientist and from a person and this comes also from a personal uh, gratitude my son is a graduate of the dp engineering academy and he's now and off in his career as an engineer and this would never have happened without this opportunity so thank you very much Ms. sins Moulton. Yes, I'd like to, to echo the comments of my sister board members. And I remember uh, when, it w when we were in person, we, you were sitting, both of you were sitting on the front row and it was asking that question, what if? And what we were going to do. And, and we didn't, we knew what if. It was, it was a matter of when we were going to do it. And so I just really appreciate having been here when it very first started. Uh, I'm sure it started in your minds as a dream. And here we are, it's, it's coming true. And I remember I did a, a slight um, tour of it and I talked about making sure that our littlest kids, my little babies are able to pay, participate in that. And so I still want to make sure that they have the opportunity to come and interact with the older students so they'll, they'll be the future state students and benefactors of, of this building. So thank you. And also to Mr. Ealings for his undying support. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Caps. Thank you for dreaming big so that so many other students, not just these students, but generations of students can dream. Thank you. And I'd just like to also express, you know, my gratitude. Um, when I was first selected on the board and uh, Emily invited me to go see the program at that time. And this is just such a dream come true. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate all your hard work and all your dedication. Um, when my daughter Sochil Munoz was there, she was part of the DPTV. And we always talk about that. And I really appreciate your support of her, Mr. Dent and seeing <laughs> that um, seeing something in her that, that really made a difference for her um, to this day. And thank you so much for the generosity of um, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Eileen's intern, sorry, I get all choked up. Um, Mr. Eileen's for just, you know, giving so generously in order for future generations to benefit from this program. Thank you so much. Um, board members, at this time, I'd like to know if you would move, uh, make a motion to approve this action item to name the approval of the naming of the Dos Pueblos Engineering Academy uh, for Mr. Ellings. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Alvarez? I move that we name the Virgil Illings Center for Creative Learning and the Virgil Illings Media Arts and Communications Center. And a second from the board. Thank you. Um, board members, if you agree with this, um, please signify. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Um, yes, the next item is the approval of the request to begin fundraising for San Marcos High School um, Health Careers Academy Capital Project. Thank you. So, let's see if she's up there. 
There she is. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Kip Glazer to discuss this wonderful project that, oh, you're on the wrong slide. It needs to be Kip's slide. Hang on just a second. It's late. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Let me introduce once again Dr. Kip Glazer. Good evening, board members, board president, Ms. Munoz, and Dr. Maldonado in the cabinet. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to present this item to you, and I'd like to introduce uh, our my co-presenter, Ms. Christy Newton. If you can please go to the next slide, please. And she's going to introduce... Um, herself and the role that she plays with our wonderful foundation, Royal Pride Foundation. Hello, board members. My name is Christy Newton, and I am honored to be here tonight to support Dr. Glazer and her presentation. Uh, I know a number of you, but for those who don't know me, I'm a third generation Santa Barbara native, and I'm a current parent at San Marcos High School. Our oldest daughter, Kira, who's in ninth grade now, uh, has a passion for mental health, as does our whole family and healthcare in general. And I'm also a volunteer board member, as Dr. Glazer said, for the Royal Pride Foundation, where I serve as chair of the development uh, committee. My professional background involves more than 25 years of working as a nonprofit uh, professional, um, in particular with an emphasis on development and fundraising. And I have led a, a number of successful large scale uh, capital campaigns in that regard. Um, again, just in opening, I'm really excited to be here tonight. I appreciate so much um, your willingness to hear our presentation, and I will turn it back over to Dr. Glazer. Thank you, Ms. Newton. Next slide, please. So this is a request for Royal Pride Foundation to raise $4.4 million on behalf of San Marcos High School to create a health career and wellness compound at San Marcos High School. Next slide, please. Before we get to the details of what we're planning to do, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. As you are all aware, the mental health crisis due to the pandemic among our young people in particular has increased drastically in recent years. And having been a healthcare academy teacher while I was a um, classroom teacher, I always saw the potential of our healthcare academy that has excellent reputation as a premier career technical education. I always wanted to know how we can mirror those two very important issue to create something positive as we are serve, as we are hoping to serve our students. Next slide, please. So when I heard about uh, the bond project as DP just um, described in how they were given an opportunity to spend $5 million in bond project, I was also given an opportunity to spend $4.4 million to replace all the portables um, on our campus. And I thought about a way to leverage that resource that was given to us as a school to continue promoting our CTE uh, program, as well as creating the physical space to continue educating and serving our students. And most importantly, with a school that has the healthcare academy, how can we become a center for providing wellness and mental health for our community? Next slide, please. So with, uh, with help from Royal Pride Foundation, we're proposing the following um, capital project. Next slide, please. We would like to propose that we build a brand new healthcare academy building and upgrade the existing wellness center to provide not only the education for our healthcare academy students, but also school-based mental health service 
that could be a, a center of all things mental health and wellness promotion here at San Marcos High School. Next slide, please. So we're proposing a U-shaped building to be built by the stadium, where currently we have several portables. And in the center of that U, we are suggesting, or we're proposing that we create a demonstration room that is very similar to any state-of-the-art hospital uh, classroom. And then we are also proposing that it will be flanked by two rows of classrooms, one of which will be a bio, um, biology lab because there is already an existing water and gas access up by the stadium. Next slide, please. In addition, we're proposing that we remodel our current wellness center to provide a space for our all of our mental health education as well as school-based mental health therapy. So in the plan, you can see that we're proposing building three small therapy room for, rooms for individual therapy for our students, which is being um, provided currently in an office um, in the main administration building, as well as creating a large therapy room which is being provided in regular classrooms. Sometimes when they have to meet as a group to receive therapy, they have to move from classroom to classroom. So we are uh, we're proposing that we create a very student-friendly welcoming space in this wellness center. Also, we're proposing that wellness center be um, and wellness center will include a meeting room where community outreach and education can happen in a systematic manner. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to belabor the point because there is an actually detailed estimated budget. Uh, next slide, please. Which um, totals about $6.2 million for the building. Next slide, please and about $1.5 million for wellness center upgrade, which includes the HVAC uh, re, um, installation for that building. Um, so in total, we estimate that it's going to be about $8.8 million, $8 million. So next slide, please. Now, Ms. Newton will explain how we can turn $4.4 million into $8.8 million to bring this project to San Marcos High School. Yes, um, we will. It's incredibly exciting. So thank you, Kit, for explaining the, the vision. I have to tell you, as a relatively new parent at San Marcos High School with my first and oldest daughter um, as, a, as a ninth grader, I think you all can relate who have children. Um, I was so I was so thrilled when I met Dr. Glazier and realized, and I've met so many staff and other teachers and leaders at San Marcos High School, just the quality of, of commitment and dedication. And so um, as a parent, I was thrilled. As a, as a new member of the Royal Pride Foundation Board, I was thrilled to hear that our principal had such a compelling vision for positive change at a time when we so acutely need solutions around healthcare and mental health. Um, so I very enthusiastically agreed um, volunteer uh, help Dr. Glazier to just do a really early assessment of the feasibility of leveraging and matching the 4.4 million with a uh, successful fundraising campaign. And um, how we went about this is just in speaking informally with a, a significant handful of key local foundations and philanthropists just to check on the interest and the resonance and to see what the appetite might be for investing in this uh, project and this campaign. And the response has been overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive. Um, the community is so eager to hear more about this um, and it's evidenced, um, next slide please. It's, it's evidenced in the support that this project has already garnered. Um, I, I think many of you know that Thanks to the leadership of KIPP and the team at San Marcos, um, this project, the Health Careers Academy specifically, has already uh, garnered a $675,000 grant through the K-12 Strong Workforce Program, which is primarily for equipment as well as professional development and programming. Um, and we also received this incredible grant from the Mosier Foundation 
um, which was really initiated by the Mosier Foundation. When they heard from Kip about this vision, they were so excited. And they said, it's great that you have a very strong board of volunteers uh, with, through the Royal Pride Foundation and through parents who are eager to help, but you're going to need a professional campaign consultant to make sure this project is successful, which is very true. So we're delighted that the Mosier Foundation has already uh, granted 25,000 toward hiring a consultant so that we will have the support we need to be very successful in this effort. So in summary, this campaign has all the ingredients for success. And I say this not just as a very enthusiastic community member and parent, but as a almost three decade professional uh, development um, nonprofit leader who has raised many, many uh, successful uh, campaigns. Um, this project has all the ingredients, a clear and compelling vision addressing a high priority, well understood community need with a clear um, impact and, and positive change associated with, with the project, passionate and prepared leadership, very strong support from the school district thanks to the bond, which is incredible leverage. And again, through our initial feasibility, a community that is exceedingly eager to support this. So we are just um, really just delighted to, to share this with you. And um, Dr. Glazer and I and the team at the Royal Pride Foundation have a high degree of confidence that we will meet and exceed this goal. Um, and really, again, personally, it's a deep honor. And I really mean that to be involved in this project. I have no doubt the impact will be profound and will last for generations to come. So I'm honored to share that with you. And before I turn this back over to Dr. Glazer, I really wanna say from the bottom of my heart as someone who has been a school board member for a very small local elementary school, Hope School District for four years, um, I know the commitment and the passion and the dedication that you all bring. And it was on display tonight and I just want to salute you and thank you for what you do for our students and our schools. Dr. Glazer. Thank you, Do and next slide, please. Um, as Ms. Newton said, we just wanna thank you. And I just wanted to point out that um, this project from day one, when I saw the sign at Wellman Center has been my dream to bring to San Marcos. And not only will it impact 200 or so our uh, students who are participating in the Health Career Academy, this Wellness Center upgrade in particular will impact the entire San Marcos, because we need not only the dedication and service and the hours, but space for students to feel welcome and learn about mental health and wellness in a way that is supportive and loving. So, and once our students who are in Healthcare Academy are able to learn more about how important wellness overall is, they will go out into the community and make an impact. They've already done it for over 20 years. And I think this is gonna just take the impact to the larger community to the next level. So thank you for giving us the time to share our exciting vision with you. And now I will take any questions you will have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comment on this item? No public comment on this item. Okay, um, board members, do you have any questions or comments? Ms. Alvarez? First of all, thank you. Thank you very much for your vision, for your work, for your commitment. This project, I'm so excited. I'm so happy to see it. and. I want to support you any way I may, so keep sending me an email, let me know how I can help. And I do have a, a question, maybe I missed it in your presentation. W what's your time frame to raise the 4.4 million that you, are, um, that you mentioned? Do you want me to address that, Dr. Glazier, or you want to take it? Yes, yeah. please. So our, our um, estimate is two years. We think that it will take, um, approximately two years to raise the 4.4 million. Now, that may sound uh, very optimistic, but it's really grounded in reality based on my very strong sense and our, our, our team's strong sense of the eagerness of the community to invest in this project. So our plan is over the first uh, year to focus on the large naming gifts 
that will really uh, launch the project, the million dollar plus investments, and then in the second year to, to, to raise the additional funds that are needed to get us over the goal line. It may end up stretching to three, but our, our plan is a two-year plan that we currently are working with. Thank you. And it could be shorter, I should say that, based on how the community responds. Uh, Ms. Ford? Uh, no questions, just absolutely certain that you will make your goal, I can tell. I. I I know you, Dr. Glazier, and uh, Ms. Newton, you seem to know exactly what you're doing and, uh, and have all the skills. Uh, I also just want to thank you for your kind comments about board service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. Kelly? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to say it's, it's great to finally uh, hear about this. I know you've been thinking about this a while. I remember my freshman year, um, I was at a PTSA meeting and Dr. Glazier had brought up this idea, and now I'm thrilled to see it actually happening in action. It's crazy how full circle um, this has come. But yeah, I, I know that this will help the students at San Marcos. Um, for a while, we've had a need for mental health resources and education, and we still do district-wide, but this is a step in the right direction. So I'm thrilled to see this project happening. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Newton, as well. Ms. Sims Moulton. Thank you. Um, yes, I too want to uh, echo the enthusiasm that you're showing, and I, I know you'll do it. We've seen it. We just talked about a project that came to fruition, so this is the this will be our next one with regards to, and just really appreciate the the vision that you have to meet our current needs of our students as well as the future needs uh, of our students, and and I really appreciate the wellness because that's a really what we're we're talking about. We're well mentally, physically, all of those things can be uh, incorporated. So I appreciate that, and also appreciate. Um, the fiscal uh, responsibility in terms of matching the dollars and maximizing the dollars. We know how critical that is, though it becomes this um, part of the community, making the community healthy, healthier with regards to our wellness center. We have well kids, better kids coming out there and being a lot healthier with regards to that as also as well as um, our administration. So thank you so much for your vision and I, I know that it's going to happen. Yes, Ms. Caps. I want to add my sincere thanks and what a bright spot of the meeting to focus on these two incredible academies, one of which is already underway uh, and the other, which is a, a more of a dream, but I am such a fan of, of the health Academy at San Marcos. I just, I, I've been there. I've seen it. I know what access it gives so many students, children here in our community, really good jobs going forward too in this and being able to stay in Santa Barbara should they choose because uh, they are prepared to go into many different fields, not just becoming a doctor or a psychologist, but so many technical fields as well. And I, you know, to hear about the combination of a wellness center is incredibly inspiring to have that be the hub uh, at such an important time in our history to focus on mental health. And so thank you, Ms. Newton. Thank you, Dr. Glazer for this professional and very inspiring uh, presentation. And I, I, I sign me up as well to help any way that I can. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you for your presentation. I certainly, I was there at the ceremony last year for the Health Career Academy. And being that I work in that field, I certainly appreciate and seeing all the um, students that will be able to serve their community and go forward with that. I really um, also value the professionalism of the Wellness Center. It is fabulous. I have met with students there um, in the past on campus and certainly a professional place and a place for groups that they could know that they have it um, just for them and they have that privacy um, and, and also the community outreach. Thank you so much, Dr. Glazer and Ms. Newton. Thank you so much. I also want to be signed up to help. <laughs> Um, and board, I'd like to know if someone, if one of you would make a motion to approve the San Marcos High School Health Careers Academy Capital Project. So moved. I'm jumping in. Okay. Yes, I'm, Ms. Caps, I believe. Oh, Ms. Caps. Okay. And Ms. Second. Okay. And a second from Ms. Sims Moten. Um, thank you, Ms. Caps. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. 
We will now consider item H3 to approve uh, La Cuesta and Alta Vista High Schools 2021-22 plans for student achievement. This is, no, of course, this is the one for um, La Cuesta and Alta Vista. Let's go. Ah, yes. Ms. Carey, go ahead, please. All right. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. And good evening, Board President Munoz, board members. Um, and thanks for having me here on this as we continue the tour through the high schools, uh, building on the awesome presentations coming out of DP and San Marcos and, and their teams and partners. Um, in the fall, you as a board uh, got to review and learn about and ask questions about and ultimately approve the single plans for student achievement for all of our schools uh, on November 16th, but due to unforeseen and unforeseeable circumstances, we were not able to bring you those SIPSs as we call them for La Cuesta and for Alta Vista. Uh, on behalf of Principal Amaral, I am bringing them before you tonight, uh, their planned expenditures to improve student outcomes, um, executive summaries of their of their budgets. Uh, as a reminder for you and for the public, uh, Principal Amaral is, serves as the principal over, over both of these schools. La Cuesta is our continuation school, high school, and Alta Vista is a, an alternative school um, that serves uh, multiple programs uh, within its offerings and school code. Um, you are familiar with SIPSAs, but if you have any questions about the SIPSA in general or about these specific SIPSAs coming before you tonight, I'm, I'm here to respond to those to the best of my ability. And we seek your approval of these plans. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Carey. Um, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any comments, public comments on this item? No public comment on this item. Okay, um, thank you. Um, board members, do you have any questions? Um, yes, Ms. Alvarez. Ms. Carey, in the plan it talks about a new position of coordinator of student community relations. Has this been filled? And if so, how's that going? Uh, I'm gonna defer right now to Dr. Becchio if he's in the room there and can respond. Sorry, could you just repeat the position that you asked about? Yes, in the, in the plan it says that a new position would be formed in, in its coordinator of student community relations. Um, let me check tomorrow when I get to my office on that and I'll send you a update on that position. Uh -huh. uh, okay, um, seeing no other um, questions on this um, board members do I have a motion to um, <clears throat> excuse me would like someone like to make a motion to approve Miss Ford uh, yes I'd like to make a motion to approve La Cuesta and Alta Vista high schools 2021-22 plans for student achievement okay and Miss Alvarez for a second um, board yes. members all in favor uh, please raise your hand and say aye aye, okay. aye. The item passes unanimously. Okay, the next item is number four, approval of the Santa Barbara Unified School District proposal to reopen contract negotiations with SBTA. Thank you, once, you. thank you once again, and <laughs> you see before you the same proposal. You've seen it twice now, and I bring it before you for this board's approval so we can move forward with negotiations with SBTA. Um, board members, do I have a motion to approve this item? to reopen contract negotiations with SBTA. 
Uh, Ms. Ford for. Please. I, <clears throat> oh, yes. Motion to approve. I second. Okay. Um, board members, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> the next one, number five, is approval of. SBTA proposal to reopen contract negotiations with Santa Barbara Unified School District. Correct. Thank you. And for us to move forward with negotiating with SBTA, we also are requesting the board take action on their proposal for reopening negotiations with Santa Barbara Unified. Okay. Board members, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Ms. Alvarez? Second. And Ms. Sims Moten for a second. Um, please raise your hand and signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, number six is the adoption of resolution number 2021-2217 in honor of Black History Month by Ms. Sims Moten and Ms. Ford. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. And, uh, members of the board and members of the public i'm so appreciative of bringing this ahead of time to ensure that when february 1st come we're already set to celebrate um black history month so thank you for indulging uh, myself and miss ford of getting this resolution on this on this board meeting so i appreciate that and i also um just appreciate the uh, partnership with miss ford working on this resolution we're really excited to present this um this board tonight also want to acknowledge um some input from gateway educational thing just to make sure tutoring's out there educational things are out there that we're addressing this you know and, and as i said we're excited to present this resolution for black history month not as a perfunctionary routine for acknowledging Black History Month, but more about learning and discerning and seeking the history and learning more about a history that hasn't really been on the forefront and also connecting it to how we are working through history and learning better from that to the things that we're doing today. And we must not continue to ignore the histories of folks as if it was happening in another country. These things happen in America and we need to make sure that those things are acknowledged, acknowledged so we can have a better future. So that when others look at back look back at this time in history, they can see that we are working together to be more inclusive, have a more inclusive history that acknowledge the contributions of all, and we minimize the disparities that we often hear about. And I just I also want to just say how much how important it is in terms of uh, of the input uh, of this, and hopefully that you are going to be receive this with a with a curious mind and enthusiasm to learn more about black history you know as this great country we talk about the land of the free and liberty and justice for all but we cannot become that country until that the sum of all of its parts is part of the history as opposed to some of them not being a part of the history so it's really important that we acknowledge all who have contributed to this and with that i also want to thank my sister board members and our fellow junior fellow down there board member uh, <laughs> uh, to help in the reading of this resolution and i i think for the honor and privilege to start us off whereas black history month celebrated during the month of february originated in 1926 when dr carter g woodson set aside a special period in february to recognize the heritage and achievements of black people in the united states and whereas many black Americans lived and died in obscurity, never achieving the recognition those individuals deserved, and yet they paved the way for future generations. There are so many stories that have yet to be told about the history of black health in black America. For a better tomorrow, we must elevate the stories of a past to inform and help us know from whence we come and understand how past experience have shaped who we are today. And Whereas with a balanced and positive exploration of culture and history, as well as the important but sometimes difficult learning about the struggles of black people, we learn about and appreciate contributions that have a powerful impact on our lives and... Whereas community conversations, celebrations, and multicultural and inclusive curricula are enthusiastic and captivating ways to help us understand the challenges, to see the triumphs that inspire us to search beyond the typical, and to seek out the extraordinary. And whereas the theme of Black History Month 2022, Black Health and Wellness, acknowledges the legacy of not only Black scholars and medical practitioners in medicine, 
but also recognizes other ways that black communities have worked to achieve wellness amid challenges, t challenging times while seeking opportunities to change the narrative and better engage and serve the needs of a community that doesn't see themselves in providers of health care and Whereas black health and wellness not only includes one's physical well-being, but also emotional and mental health. At this point in the 21st century, our understanding of black health and wellness is broader and more nuanced than ever. And whereas, since the many inequities in, in social determinants of health and, and the still overhanging shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic, put racial and ethnic groups at a greater risk of serious illness or death. It is important to shine a light on the multiple facets of black health and wellness through education and engagement. There is much more to uncover, amplify, question, and correct, and. Whereas we must work to eliminate the historical disparities and institutional barriers to developing more diversity among practitioners and more proportionate representation within STEM and healthcare fields. Santa Barbara Unified School District supports expanded access to specialized opportunities for engaging students in a career technical pro in career technical programs such as healthcare careers, health careers, sports and medicine pathways, as well as other programs that promote wellness. And whereas in 2019 we witnessed and celebrated when Governor Gavin Newsom created the new role of Surgeon General to address health issues and challenges in the state and appointed Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, a black woman and pediatrician, to become the state's first ever Surgeon General. Now therefore be it resolved that the Santa Barbara Unified School District Board of Education does hereby adopt this resolution to encourage Black History Month as an opportunity to bridge the past to a better and brighter future. We must not only prepare each of our students for a world that is yet to be created, we must strive to equip each student to face the world and to change it for the betterment of all. And be it further resolved that Santa, that Santa Barbara Unified continues its commitment to anti-racism, equity, and access to education as a core value manifested by a steadfast commitment to creating welcoming, nurturing environments for all students and families, as well as direction of the supports and resources needed to eliminate barriers and promote student success and wellness. That concludes reading of the resolution, Madam President. May I have a bo uh, motion to approve this resolution? Public comment. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, um, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comment on this item? Thank you, President Munoz. We do have public comment. Um, Rene Garcia Hernandez. Hola, buenas noches al superintendente y a la mesa directiva. Solamente quiero decir que estoy en apoyo de esta resolución. Es muy importante que sigamos nuestro compromiso a la antinegritud, a la equidad racial y al acceso de educación con esos valores centrados en esa resolución, especialmente con nuestro compromiso de, de, de equidad en nuestro distrito unificado. Así que es con gran honor como una persona de... Um, que no es negra y de color, de apoyar esto en solidaridad y seguir adelante uh, para un futuro mejor. Así que muchas gracias a todos los que pusieron esto en esfuerzo, a Gateway Educational Services y a, a Wendy Simpson por todo el apoyo y a todas las organizadoras um, negras que en verdad pusieron mucho esfuerzo para que estas cosas sigamos adelante como comunidad. Así que Gracias por este compromiso y estoy en apoyo de esta, de esta resolución. Gracias. Okay, thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Uh, do I have a motion for the adoption of resolution number 2021-2217 in honor of Black History Month? So moved. Okay, um, second. Hey, um, board members, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Yes. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, uh, now we'll go to board action on student transfer case 2021 221-02. Uh, board members, do I have a motion to, um, I'm sorry, to approve this item? Move approval of uh, board action on student transfer. Okay. Do I, I have second. a second? I second. Ms. Alvarez for a second. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay. Oh. Okay. Motion passes in unanimously. <clears throat> uh, okay. The. Second one, board members, do I have a motion to approve board action on student discipline, education code 48918, case number 2021-2211? Is it 10? 110. 10. Yeah, 10. I'm sorry? Yeah, one it's zero. 2020. 10. Zero. Okay, 10. Yeah. Expulsion with enforcement suspended, so moved. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay. Passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, board act number nine, board action on student discipline, education code 48918, case number 2021-22-11. Move approval for full expansion to sem two semesters, which end June 22, 2022. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? I second. Okay. Um, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay. Passes unanimously. Uh, board action on student discipline education code 48918, case number 2021. 22-11? Uh, 14. Uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Dash 14? Yes. Move approval, stipulate agreement, full expulsion, two semesters, which end June 2022. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay. Number 11, uh, Board Action on Student Discipline, Education Code 48918, case number 2021-22-15. Move approval, full exp expulsion, two semesters, which end January 2023. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay. Passes unanimously. Number 12, Board Action on Student Discipline, Education Code 48918, case number 2021-22-16. Move approval, expulsion with enforcement suspended, two semesters which end June 2022. Second. Okay, um, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay, number 13, uh, Board Action on Student Discipline, Education Code 48918, case number 2021-22-18. Move approval, full expulsion, two semesters, which in January 2023. Second. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Okay, passes unanimously. Madam President, I would like to um, ask to remove the last two items that are left on our agenda under report, section I. I believe that these two items are extremely important for us to consider and at this late hour, I think they deem um, us putting it on next agenda in February and I would like to have it be a time certain item if um, you and I can discuss that at our agenda setting meeting so that we can ensure that we give due attention to both the governor's proposed 2022-2023 budget report and also to the most important update, which is the school-based mental health services update that Dr. Wagenick has prepared, 
With your permission, I'd like to pull that item. If you approve that, I'd like to make one more announcement. Certainly. Go ahead. Thank you. With that, I also would like to ask board, uh, student board member Mr. Kelly to make an announcement about something, a new project that he will be engaged in that was connected to our student, uh, sorry, to our school-based mental health services report, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Okay, it's been a long time coming. Everyone listening, get out your phones, go to Instagram, the account is live. We have SBUSD student board member on Instagram. <laughs> Uh, repeat it one more time, SBUSD student board member. I know, very exciting. Um, thank very. you, Mr. Madsuda, for helping me with that. Great help. Um, so what do, what do I plan to do with this, you may ask. Um, what you know, do you plan to do with Just it? another Instagram account. What I have noticed is <laughs> a lot of students um, use social media very frequently, myself included. And uh, the point of my position is to make a to represent the students and to allow for the district and the student body to communicate more effectively and I believe this is the most efficient route to do that um, so I will be frequently posting updates on board meetings as well as getting students more involved with public comments Instagram polls surveys allowing them to DM me on Instagram um, all lines of communication are open and I just hope we can create a better dialogue and get students more informed because when people are more informed then they will say what they feel and are more likely to um, represent themselves better and I've seen that firsthand by being more informed on this board I'm able to make more decisions that affect um, yeah that affect my life so I'm super excited for this I hope you guys are too if you have any suggestions let me know. But yeah, SBUSD student board member. One more time for everyone listening that hasn't followed yet. And I'm following you. Thank you. And I'll do more announcements with the school ASB and SB Unified to push out this account. But this is just the rough launch. Great. I, I just need someone to help me get an Instagram account. That's not, that's not who I am. I have little ones that I deal with, so they don't have Instagram <laughs> accounts yet. <laughs> Nick, Nick has I'll get OK, great, Nick. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. That was that was just something we were preparing for tonight, but we'll talk more about it at the next meeting. We're connected back to Dr. Wagonick. I want to thank her, and I also want to thank Kim Hernandez for the, the reports that they have prepared. Thank you. Thank you all, and I got it, Dawson. <laughs> Mr. Kelly. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so are there any, let's see, coming events that board members would like to share? I will be sharing some Black History Month events that will be coming. They'll be coming before we, we meet again. So I'll be sharing that out so that everybody can uh, take the opportunity to listen. Some are online and some, I don't know that any will be in person. But uh, make sure that everybody has that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. sims Um And uh, future agenda items. As Dr. Maldonado said, the two items from today will be next um, time. And any other future agenda items to add? Okay, um, with that, we conclude our meet. Let's see, the, the next uh, school board meeting is Tuesday, February 8th, uh, regular board meeting at 5.30. And um, with that, we conclude at 10.37 um, on this Tuesday night. Thank you so much. <laughs>